Welcome to our briefing this morning. It's September 14th. And we will start with, um, so we are doing introductions. So in the Zoom room, let's start with the commissioners. Kevin Schutte. Randy Netherland. Aaron Trask. And start with WSU. Dan Tudorberg. Okay. And then who else do we have on I'm the line? Lisa DeWall. Lisa. Frank Pinter. Kelly Frazier. And it looks like Cheryl. And we have Cheryl Hill and Jason Dreckably in the sheriff's office. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right, Dan, take her away. Well, good morning, commissioners. Thanks for the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, you should have received our summer 2020 quarterly report. Kind of goes over all of our programs that we've been doing um, all summer, early, late spring in, into now. Uh, just a few touch points for you. Um, as you're well aware, things might have majorly shifted for all of our trainings and educational pro programs that we have been doing for, for a very long time. Uh, we shifted to an online presence. Um, which which uh, came with some, learn, we'll just call them learning opportunities for many of our volunteers and foragers, master gardeners, and all those players who we play with quite a bit. Um, w, so structurally, our office is, is open uh, by appointment. If people can come in, we have the requirements the county have, uh, but we also have the WSU requirements and they're a bit stricter than, than the county. Uh, we are not allowed to hold face-to-face -face meetings at all for 4-H or master gardeners. Um, even though the state has the 10 or less if you're phase three and all that. So uh, we're not able to do that at this time. Um, I am on a reopening committee for 4 youth development across our state. Uh, we are battling what it looks like to reopen in a safe environment for our youth and our, and our volunteers. So trying to get that put in, in place. Um, so uh, as your, uh, our 4 H our new 4 H year kicks off October 1. So we're hoping to have some, some better guidelines in place for that. Um, just wanna go and hit a few high points for you so you're kind of aware. Um, our Summer in a Bag program that we did for 4-H reached over 120 families in, in Mason County. Uh, we were able to put together the, the cinch sack bags with eight or nine educational hands-on uh, tools in them. And it was a huge hit. We had a lot of donations come in from businesses and, and members, um, one uh, for each volunteer put together the lemon testing battery kit himself at home, bought the supplies, put together 200 of them and those went in there. So uh, just some awesome dedicated volunteers. Our fair didn't happen this year. Uh, so we shifted to an online format. Um, it's not easy shifting to an online format in less than a month, uh, but we were able to do that very, very successfully. Um, we've had over 200 entries in that where we had our trained our judges to go in and judge and some of the uniqueness of that which i thought was really unique we offered a virtual barn tour so those who have livestock and animals took their video recording devices and and toured us on their barn and it was neat to see uh what what some of the foragers have at, at home and some of the pieces that that came out of this i just want to share are those unique learning skills that they picked up on videography, video editing, narration, things like, like that. Just some skills that, that we would not have associated with that, with that type of environment. We offered big challenges and things like that to keep our, our foragers engaged. Um, we are holding uh, office hours weekly, virtually, and uh, some of our volunteers pop on every single week. And one of them has a quote saying, that's the reason I get out of bed and shave uh, is, is to hop on that call. So it's nice to have those connections happening. A very unique emotional one is that our summer camp uh, did not happen this summer. And um, so we called it Camp Not Happening. And if, if you ever were in a summer camp program, you know the tradition behind an annual summer camp experience. So they, the, the volunteers and staff created kits that went out to past 4-H campers. And in there were the memorable song books and things like that but also a t-shirt or sweatshirt uh, with the logo of Camp Not Happen in 2020 so that it keeps that, that momentum going. 
oftentimes they, they create like t-shirt quilts and things with their years of, of their camping experience. So we wanted to honor that, that tradition. Also kept those members engaged as well. So our summer, pro, our, our summer camp program was still a, a, a big hit as well. Um, our small farms program, Kendall Carmen started in April and she's been a tremendously successful reaching out to our small farm programs in Mason County. Um, we're, we're launching a cultivating success program that's gonna support the small scale agriculture farmers coming up in partnership with our Grace Harbor program. Our Farm Fresh Guide 2020 is available on our website. It's also distributed to lots of places throughout Mason County. You can swing by our office and pick one up as well. And we're, and we're planning our septic workshop. It typically helps help the county too. Our Master Gardener program, again, shifted quite a bit. Um, that's a unique program. Uh, often the skill sets aren't there to shift to an online presence. Uh, and I'm happy to report that many of them have able to, to step up and, and help support that. Our trainings and plant clinics are available on, online. People can email, call, and, and those pieces. Um, and I'm proud to say that the food bank support from Catalyst Park is still happening. So far, over 1,600 pounds of produce has been donated to local food banks. And just last week, 65 pounds of green beans was donated uh, with that bumper heat wave one weekend, it just it just exploded. So plans are underway to support a virtual presence Master Gardener program for the, the, this next go around as well. Um, it's interesting planning these programs. You want to plan them virtually with the face-to-face -face phase in when we can, not knowing when that's going to happen. So it's often double the work to, to, to plan and then to modify and ship back. And you have the, those players that don't want to go face to face, so still keeping them in, engaged is, um, is some careful dialogue on that. And lastly, I just want to touch base on our, our Not Just Wheat program, tremendously successful program. Um, and because of, of Pat's uh, work and her planning and her skill set in that area, she, she was able to, to, to get a, a workforce from the state DNR program to come in. They weren't able to fulfill some of their work because of the COVID requirements. She was ready to, to take them on and they were able to do some aquatic plant um, uh, work in, in Mason County. Um, her numbers are, are there for you, but she was able to, to do 296 parcels so far with 48 site consultations as well. Just a, a, a tremendous program. Um, but I did want to tell you, Heidi, her, 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 uh, her, her assistant did take a new position uh, in Thurston County. So uh, Pat's been working with the HR uh, department here to shift some of those responsibilities and to look at increasing her hours, just shifting funds for, for this uh, remaining year um, to, to get that, that workload done. Um, and she's working with HR on that. So that's just more of a heads up for you guys. Um, that's, that's it. If you have any questions, uh, if you can take a look at, at the summer uh, uh, report there. Otherwise, plans are underway for the new fall and, and, and winter term with us. All right, great, great. I need to talk to a master gardener. My tomatoes are probably the, the plants themselves are seven to eight feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> and harvesting some of those tomatoes way at the top, I'm having an uh, I have a little issue. <laughs> Get a ladder. <laughs> you can email our you can just take a look, you can e email and they'll help you out. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. Anybody have any questions, comments? Yeah, just real quick for Dan. Um, appreciate the updates today. It's good to it's good to see. You. It's been a little while. I know things have been been challenging over the past several months. What are you kind of hearing from Washington State uh, over you know the next several months as as they continue to adapt? What are some what are some best practices that are happening in other counties that um, you know we might be able to benefit from incorporating here? Some of the things that we're picking up on out of our extension office, um, Lewis County has shifted to a really strong online presence with their Master Gardener program. Um, it really has taken um, some key volunteers to step up and, and understand those skill sets. Um, some of the 4-H programs are slower to adapt. Uh, we're shifting, uh, I wasn't going to let you know until next update, but we, we have a a grant opportunity and received it to do some tremendous um, at-home learning opportunities with some curriculum. So we're able to support families in that environment, looking at that at-home learning base as well. Um, the drive-in Wi-Fi things are a big hit 
in, in, in certain parts. I'm much more successful in Grace Harbor. I've installed three so far in, in Grace Harbor in very rural areas like Hump Tulips and Ocasta. Um, we have those available in for, for Mason too, if you can think of any spots that need more drive-in. However, the weather is shifting as you're aware and drive-in necessarily isn't the best spot. So the shift in dialogue has been to um, more openness meetings inside uh, social distancing gymnasiums or rooms available, our conference room, if you can socially distance appropriately and meeting those guidelines for um, internet accessibility. Those are always those, those hot topics. Um, as you can see, 39 counties across the state handling this very, very differently um, is, is a challenge for WSU. And if you uh, read the news, WSU is having some COVID cases that are a bit off the charts. So uh, that, that, that's a real challenge. But some of the more savvy approaches are supporting the online formats as much as possible, meeting in small groups with volunteers once we can get the planning underway. So Dan, I'd, I'd like to just maybe chat a little bit about the hotspots. Um, I'm sure you're aware that PUD3 has been installing hotspots as well. Is that in conjunction with your program? How, how are you guys partnering on that, if at all? And then how how is yours funded? Because I know um, a later conversation we're having today uh, is going to be regarding some of our CARES Act funding and requests made by PUD specifically for that. So is there any is there any opportunity for further partnership or any other funding sources that the PUD should be thinking about going toward that you're aware of? It's all say, it, as far as I'm aware, it's out of the same state pot of money. It's all part of the um, state broadband program. Uh, WSU Extension is it's it's the same program with the PUDs uh, as well as the state library system. Um, we we have access to these units just like they do. Um, so they've been running the same program that, that we have. We just have ability to work more privately than they do. So my, my example with Hump Tulips, uh, I was able to work with a local uh, business up there. He made his, his business parking lot open to us through, through extension and, and WSU, a bit more challenging for, I think, a, a, a PUD to, to handle in that environment. Would, would you be able to forward us the... Um, the the funding that's available through the state yeah i can i, I can send you some information some on that information on that yeah i'll send it right to you kevin good thank you yeah again if you we just on friday we had a call with our county di directors if, if you can think of a spot within mason county that could use one of those units i can request one and see if, if we can get one um, I, I know the pud and mason's been very successful getting them out I was going to put one in our office in, in Shelton as well, but there's one a quarter block away. So it's kind of a, a, a redundant area. So. Yeah. What, what about up north? Are there any, have you tried to put any up north or out like in Matlock area? I need to go back and look at the state broadband map. There's a map on the, uh, on the state bad brand website that shows all the currently running ones and can kind of take a look. Um, my emphasis has been more within the Grace Harbor area. They're having a lot more connectivity challenges. So. Yeah, our PUD is doing a, a good job getting those hotspots. One out. of the best in, in the state, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they came up at our, uh, they were recognized at our, my uh, public works board meeting on Friday as being one of the, the, the top players. So pretty proud. So that's some pride, at, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. I guess well, we thank you for your time, Commissioner. What's that? What's that? Oh, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to our 915 with the Sheriff's Office. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Are we going to go around the room or should we just keep start? Um, looks like the only additional person we have on is uh, Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, um, as the, the briefing, the first briefing says, this is really informational. This is about the Sheriff's Office budget. And just to let you know, 
where we are. I know we've talked briefly uh, at other briefing meetings about uh, projections and where we think we're going to be. Right now, as of the end of August, we are 2.7% uh, underspent. But as you can see by the attached spreadsheet, that doesn't look to hold through the end of the year. So um, with the possibility of getting the CARES Act funding that we've talked about um, and you know maybe some other FEMA money, it looks like we can balance out. We just needed to update you on where we are, where we think we're going to be um, going forward and see if you had any questions about uh, any part of the budget and see if we can hire, uh, confidently hire two open positions for deputies. So Cheryl, um, it looks like a lot of the items um, could be covered by, or should be covered by CARES money. Uh, for some of the supplies, correct? That's what we're hoping. The, yes, that's one of the things we're hoping for, yes. I'll so just shine real quick. Have you been having those conversations with either our budget office, BEM, or Paige? We've been having, uh, so filling out the forms, the, the appropriate forms for the larger items. We've been doing that, but for these smaller items, uh, we've been going off the guidance that came out in, was it March or April? So those answering those five questions to, to be able to code something as, uh, as, COVID, as a COVID project. Right, and I know that, that Paige has some forms. Uh, I think, I can't remember what they're called, the 417s, I think. Are you um, sending those over to her as well? Yes. Great. Cheryl, where are we exactly on wages right now for uh, where these two would fit in? So individually or, or rolled up? Uh, uh, rolled, rolled up, please, to, to see what it would look like for an impact for, because weren't, weren't these already budgeted for or were they not budgeted for? They were budgeted for, but because we've had to absorb not only the contract increases, but the CARES Act stuff, um, we're just, we were holding positions open because uh, it, we were just awfully close. In fact, last month we were only 0.8% underspent. So right now, as of the end of August, we have a, a $233,000 underspend in wages and benefits. And the uh, anticipated if we could get those two positions in, uh, there are some laterals that we might be able to get in. First of October, we're looking at probably seventy to seventy-five thousand dollars for the rest of the year for them. For both of them combined? For both of them, because it's only four months. Mm -hmm. We but do have. A, apologize, this is uh, Chief Sperling. We do have uh, Shelton Police Department that has told us that. Um, Officer Uch, his last day is the end of this month, and they're laying him off from Shelton PD because of the school resource position that's going away. So that was my question to Cheryl is, where are we at? Can we get to the place where we can help a local agency and an officer that's fully trained? Because that saves us a lot of money from sending somebody to the academy. They just go through the FTO, and they already have a lot of their equipment. So that's what we were looking at is to help Chief Moody in the city with that. Uh, I guess what I'm looking for, and, and I appreciate it because I, I, we definitely don't want to lose somebody that already knows our area, already educated and, and ready to go to work. That makes no sense to lose them. Uh, I, my question is actually this. It's expected at the end of the year we're going to be rolling in some of this CARES Act money. So I don't worry about it from uh, the standpoint of paying for it this year. What I'm more wondering is, is, this, is bringing these two officers on going to change anything when it comes to our our ask for status quo uh, plus uh, absorb plus an addition of of the wage increases for the no. next year's budget. No, these would be to fill our uh, ninety six point five FTE level we have right now. 
Yeah, we already had these positions. We just haven't filled them. Correct. That's what I thought. So yeah, I'm in favor of moving forward. And they were already budgeted, right? They were, yes. But not the increases. Well, we, we didn't budget them budget them at quite as high uh, as a lateral would be, but um, with all of the other moving parts, we think we can, and the fact that it's only for uh, <laughs> three months, we think we can we think we can take care of it. Yeah. You can't see my fingers, but what I'm doing is holding up an inch. It's just a little bit different. That isn't that going to make or break us, I don't think. I don't think so, no. Yeah, I'm supportive. I think uh, I think it makes sense. I think you have the capacity. Um, well, obviously, as we always do, just continue to monitor through the remainder of the year. And um, as uh, Chief noted, um, laterals uh, may cost a little bit more wage and benefit wise coming in, but you save on the training side. Um, so I think uh, I think it makes sense, and I'm supportive. Great, me too. On top of that, a school resource officer is going to be one of your kinder <laughs> uh, deputies. So bringing somebody in that knows the community, knows the area, uh, even knows those kids as they get older, that's invaluable. I don't think he was a school resource officer. I think he's just the junior hire. Uh, school resource officer probably went back to the streets, and then he, being the bottom of the totem pole, last hired would be the one let go. So I don't think he was a school resource officer what, what did you say his name was? That's uh, um, Kanika Uch. He worked for the Skokomish tribe before he got hired by the city. That's what I thought. Yeah. He has a brother named Savoth Uch, who is the lieutenant for Skokomish as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Good. So yes, we'll, we're going to uh, keep a really close eye on on going what our expenses are going forward. Uh, probably not going to be able to give back 5% this year, though. Appreciate that. Thank you. Cheryl, that may happen automatically uh, with, uh, you know, maybe not 5%, but uh, that may happen automatically with the CARES money as it's coming in at the end and stuff like that. Uh, right now, I, I wouldn't worry about that. If you have it within your ability to, to snatch a couple of seasoned, uh, already trained officers, I hate to see us lose that opportunity. We only have one in our sites because that's all they're going to be laying off. Tomorrow's another day. Pick up another one. <laughs> I hear they're they're leaving in in quite massive numbers from Seattle, so I'm sure we have opportunities to get some amazing officers. We just swore one in on Tuesday from Seattle. That's right. We need to welcome him to our to our arms to our team. So unless there are any other questions, that's all I have. Uh, but Chief Drack has something else for you. So uh, I, I guess it was two weeks ago that uh, Commissioner Trask was over and we discussed a, an issue that uh, appears to be showing up in uh, law enforcement. It's going to be the new mandates that are probably going to come down for body cameras and car cameras. And for the last couple of months, I've been researching costs on them and such. And right now the cost for uh, 50 body cameras and 50 car cameras, and then the, the inf infrastructure and technology behind it, it's gonna be somewhere around seven to $800,000. Uh, the cost for that can be sp spread out over a five year period. On top of that, uh, it's my belief that I would need at least one employee that uh, is not a deputy, but just a, a community service officer that would be specialized in um, running the system, doing all the public disclosures and other uh, technical sides of the, uh, of the system. So the, the, I guess the big question here is, um, that's a lot of money to be asking for and I'm not sure where it comes from. We're pretty sure that the mandates are gonna happen. Um, we don't know if they're gonna be funded or unfunded. Um, if it's unfunded, it's going to fall on our laps. Right. I, I, I typically assume that anything coming from the state is unfunded. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, you're right. Um, any questions on that? Um, 
Chief, I'm not trying to pick a fight or anything, but it's part of my what I'm thinking in my head because I'm actually in favor of something like this at the end of the year uh, when we're looking at one-time ex, uh, cash ex expenditures. I think this might be a very good thing to look at if we have the dollars available. And I think uh, personally think that we are going to have the dollars available. But my question and my worry is we went through something like this before and then they were turned off. You know, we'd want to make sure that if we spend this kind of money that nothing gets turned off that we can okay take. so commissioner i and i appreciate you bringing that up it wasn't about 2015 that we had turned off the cameras and that was basically because of the um public disclosure requests and our inability to manage the system that was uh that we had uh the technology now and the law to the public disclosures have changed so that it's going to be a lot easier for us to manage the system the uh, the software and stuff if we design it uh, up front the right way with the right cues and stuff, we can save a lot of time and effort on our part, manpower time in managing it and uh, what have you. Before we were doing it manually with uh, staff um, spending, uh, uh, road deputies spending a whole lot of time doing that. And I believe that in 2015, we'd even submitted a request for two employees to do that. And that got turned down back then. That's, that's the way it is. Um, but to protect us from uh, public disclosure problems and getting sued because of public disclosure, we decided to shut those things down. And, but you're positive that if we uh, reinstituted it, that this would be protected, we'd be okay? I, I truly believe so. Um, I would need an, another FTE to do that, though. And one, of the, one of the things... IT as well, right? I'm sorry, what? You're working with IT as well. Uh, yes, it, it all depends on the, the system that we would get, whether we do a uh, cloud system for storing the information or whether we go through county IT. If we go through county IT, uh, I'm going to need some other money for county IT to add a server, but county IT says that they can manage it and, and take care of um, the, the data storage behind it and it being uh, CGIS certified so that it's, it's protected under well, federal statutes or whatever it is. Also, I, I can tell you, when the Washington State Patrol got car cameras, our complaints <clears throat> went down by one third just because of documentation. We've always been in favor of having video cameras, protecting the officers, and it's no longer he said, she said, you've got video. We've always wanted it. It was just that we were in violation of some of the public disclosure stuff. We couldn't keep up with it. Jeez, I'm only speaking for myself, uh, not the commission, but I, I would hope that uh, as we look on this next year, I see this as a positive. I see that, that it, there is an increase, though, uh, for the uh, ongoing. I'd love for you guys all to have a discussion with IT about uh, merging those IT issues that we have uh, with the county uh, IT staff and utilizing them for the sheriff's department so we can maybe do some cost reductions so we can uh, get you this person and uh, keep this on going. I'd like to see us move forward with this eventually. We're gonna be hit with it anyway, in my opinion. Uh, better to plan and put it in place now instead of trying to scramble to take it out of a budget or something in the future. Okay. Yeah, generally, uh, I'll just... Uh share my thoughts. Generally very supportive of it, I think, as uh, Chief Sperling mentioned, I think it's a benefit not only to the community, but to our officers and, and deputies in the community. Um, you know, it, it provides an extra layer of accountability, um, you know, that, uh, that oftentimes uh, goes, you know, uh, without when we don't have these tools at our disposal. The, uh, the options that you prevent, uh, presented here, um, Jason, are these are these least similar to um, how you approached the um, the taser program last year, or is it just you are you buying the capital and just extending the payment over a number of years, and then we'll have to re up at some point? How, how does that kind of play it's all, out? It's varying in between the, the five companies I've been looking at. Okay. So there is the option. One of them is Axon, which is the taser company. They are the the cream of the crop. Their, their costs are probably going to be somewhere more around over a five-year period, uh, eight to nine hundred thousand dollars because they manage everything. They are probably the best product out there. 
Um, there's a couple of other products that I've been looking at that are, are really good. They're, they're 80, 95% the way there, um, and they don't cost as much. You're not paying for the name brand as much. Um, one of them's a, a company called Coban. It's the same one that the state patrol is using. And it's a, it's both a body cam and a car cam system. It's, uh, it was very instrumental in a, uh, officer involved shooting case that we got involved in down in Lewis County a few months ago. And I'm telling you, when I saw that video, I, I knew that the law enforcement needs to go to that. It protects law enforcement. It protects the public. It protects everybody. Does um, who? Do, let me ask like this: Does the city of Shelton currently have body and dash cams? The city has an old product of Axon. They're currently, and we've been working with them, looking for a new product. Um, they can go their own way. They they could hop on board with us. Uh, we might be able to, if we did internal storage through county IT, we might be able to uh, store their data for them at a cost. I don't know. I, I, I don't know where they're going right now, but they've been invited to the seminars that I've put on here um, for the last, uh, I don't know, a couple months. And all they have is body cams. They do not have car cams. Mm -hmm. I, would go, I would go both body and car cams. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that's the I think that's the the wise move. I would be interested to see if they're you know I know this this is the quotes are for fifty. I don't know if getting an additional twenty five, um, you know, in on a contract with the city makes sense. If that you know changes the economies of scale and, and pricing or kind of how how this world works. But I would be interested in seeing what um, potential exists on a partnership with the city. I think they might appreciate that um, as much as as we would. Um, so just the thought, if it's not, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but I think it would be, I think it would be good to kind of have a, um, you know, a unified front on this and, and kind of make, ensure folks in the community that, you know, the, the, the two largest law enforcement agencies in the county are utilizing, you know, the same technology or similar technology and, and have a similar approach to this, uh, you know, in, implementing a program like this. Right. You might you might want to hit share, or Chief Moody before his 130 days, 131 days are gone. He might be interested in doing this because of that. <laughs> Open the wallet a little bit before he heads out. <laughs> all right. Well, I think you all know that I'm very supportive and I, I we all know that this is coming down from the state. They're going to um, they're going to hit us with another unfunded mandate soon. They're so having their task force. What would the course of action be for, for us next? What would you look for out of uh, the sheriff's office in uh, with going out looking for contracts? How, how would I go about that? So I, I, I'll just maybe just chime in with a couple of things that I would be looking for. I would, I would be looking for you to come back with a, with a firm recommendation. Um, here you have, uh, you know, five alternatives. I would, I would probably be looking for you to come back with one preferred alternative and, and maybe an alternate to that. Um, you know, and then really kind of hammering out first the partnership possibilities, and secondly, you know, kind of what you know, what kind of a policy do we need to have in place to ensure that we're meeting the public records request standards. Um, and then what that looks like from a staffing perspective. I know you mentioned a, a CSO doing that. Um, is there is, is that a, is that the right way to go, or are there clerical positions that, that we could um, you know uh, that we could look at that would potentially be a little bit cheaper, but still have um, you know this kind of a, a focus and skill set. So I think you know this is a really good start. I think you did a great job. I mean, you even included here about what the changes to upfitting costs would be because that's a, that's a really important part. Uh, as we look at next year's, you know, um, fleet purchases, but um, just kind of just coming back with a just a really more preferred option for the sheriff's office that works for you, um, and and harder numbers. Okay, we'll do. Chief, I, I, this is Randy. I also have an opinion on that. I, I'd, again, I would like to remind you, I'd hope you would sit down and work with IT to look at some of the different cost savings, what we might be able to do internal, uh, how we may be able to pull together some of our some of our stuff uh, and have a cost savings so we can maybe hire on. 
uh, those partnerships are extremely important and I'm hoping that you would have it set up. Uh, I do want an alternative. I'd like to have your recommendations though with the idea of keeping some internal if we can do it and be prepared uh, for us to have a solid plan for the budget uh, to look at next year's uh, addition for, uh, for uh, one-time expenditures for equipment. Okay. Thank you. I think you, you, you spoke when we, when we were talking, um, this would be a person that would work um, administratively, right, um, with Tammy. Yes, a CSO, clerk, something like that. I, I, I don't know what the nature or what the title would be on that position, but yes, it would be work under uh, our records division. Great. If I may include a question here, commissioners, is this for the 2021 budget? that you're looking for information for? Uh, this is Randy, I, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, just wanted to confirm that. Uh, I guess we could have a, a, different, a different approach. I would, I'd like to you know, have that conversation be guided by you know, what Jason's able to kind of figure out in terms of you know, what their preferred alternative is and, and have an idea for it. I think ultimately, even if we made a decision you know, immediately this month, I think it probably would push into 2021. I don't know what the, I don't know what the, um, you know, the, the, the timeline is to have this equipment received, upfitted, implemented and everything. So I, I do think it's a multi-month process, but, um, you know, I, so I, I think it's probably going to be a little bit of a both and kind of deal. Okay. If I can interrupt. Um, I, I know for a fact in talking with the providers, um, they're all getting hammered from other law enforcement agencies asking the exact same thing. So they're all have high demand upon them for producing their products and getting them out. So the sooner that we can make a decision and get our, our order in, I think the better off we're going to be. Yes, it may come in 2021, but I think the sooner that we make the order and, and get in line, we'll be better off. And I think this is not going to be just a Washington state issue. I think it's going to be a national. I think it's every state going to be um, going this way. This is Jennifer Byerly. Do you mind if I interrupt for just a moment? No. Um, I just wanted to state that uh, we would need to do an RFP for this. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. that was the question I was going to ask because it has here sole source, interlocal or RFP. And um, so I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with that direction too. So maybe having a draft, Jason, a draft RFP would probably be the next, one of the next steps to take in the interim. Okay. I'll get it out in the next couple of weeks. Great, thank you. I'm done. I think. <laughs> Do we have anything for the sheriff's office? Commissioner, Shooter, was this the time you wanted to talk about uh, the Marine Patrol stuff? Uh, we can, um, since you're here. I know that was an item that we had on our that I had on our commissioner discussion for later. Um, you know, but uh, we can we can move it to now if, if the commission's okay with that. I think it's a great idea. So basically, I just I kind of wanted to follow up on um, Chief's email from last week. Um, there's been a lot of talk, in particular at Mason Lake, um, regarding some of the boating activities there and safety concerns. And so um, I know Kitsap had taken some measures to, um, you know, to address it. Uh, Sergeants are... Uh, um, Trevor Severance had put together a, or sent over a, a copy of an ordinance from uh, Pierce County that um, that has a, a, a boating advisory committee. And so I just, I kind of wanted to get a sense for where the commission was and wanting to look at this issue. Commissioner Netherland, you could probably appreciate, uh, it's been a couple of years since we've had a, a boating conversation. So it feels like we're due every couple of years to have one uh, that, that gets complicated and, and, uh, and messy, but um, just kind of wanted to get some sense of where the commission was. And obviously with Chief Sperling and Drackably on the, on the line here, if there are any, any questions on the survey that was attached or any other 
Well, that discussion will be due by our choice or not our choice, but it'll be coming. <laughs> True. I guess, you know, one of the things about having a voting advisory um, committee is, you know, is, is always the same concern is, you know, how, how do we manage that? How do we, is that something that lives in the sheriff's office or is that something that, that you know, falls under us? Um, is it a matter of, you know, is, is, is it a matter of, do we know what ought to be done and do we need to go that route? You know, and so I just, I have some questions, I guess, about that being a, a preferred route, but um, kind of open it up for discussion. I think uh, Sergeant Severance was just bringing it up, uh, seeing if it would be a possible solution. He said that the, the sheriff's office is, the, they sit in the chair position of that committee but it also provides for communities or homeowner associations, whatever it is that's bringing a complaint. It provides a separate body, not just the sheriff's office, not just the commission, that that's what their main focus is, is to examine, re-examine uh, the waterway rules and ordinances that we have and the watercraft ordinances that we have. And it may be a better body of diversity that would be able to address some of these things. He, he was just throwing it out there. Uh, I said, hey, let's forward it and see what the commission thinks. We can have a say on the ordinances, but we've learned anything over the years. Uh, we don't have a say as the commission when it comes to implementation at all. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. It, uh, the ordinance aspect, I don't have any issue with, but uh, uh, a inappropriate uh, sense of security by them thinking that us uh, running this would make it uh, be implemented different uh, isn't realistic. Yeah, you're, you're right. It doesn't matter what ordinances are in place if we don't have the manpower or the, the resources to enforce it or it just, you know, a lot of it, it has to be in our presence uh, unless it's a, a certain type of a crime. We have to witness the crime in order to enforce it. And with the sound meters and the way that ordinance is written, it's very hard for us to do anything. You have to be on shore and you have to measure the boat between two certain distances and it has to read a certain decibel level. It becomes super complicated. Uh, I think there'd be ways we could possibly simplify it. I know Mason Lake, well, we've met with them multiple times and they're having their conversation as to whether they wanted to try to see if an ordinance could be put in place to, to do away with over the transom boats. We were under the impression that some of our neighboring counties had ordinances prohibiting them, but Trevor found out last week that they don't have them. Uh, it just happens to be that Mason Lake is a nice, long, skinny lake that allows them to zip along. Uh, and then when we show up, we have to go on the boat lift and they the word gets out and they all disappear. And that's the complaint that they have is, well, they don't do it when you're here. I know, <laughs> but we can't be there all the time. Most crimes are committed when you're not there. <laughs> yeah, everybody seems to be on good behavior when we're flying the flag. So I, you know, I guess you know, from my perspective, I'd be I'd be interested in looking at a, um, you know, the the consequences and benefits of of having the um, restrictions on certain lakes for the over the transom boats. I think um, folks that live around Mason Lake uh, or that use uh, that the campground there to recreate. Um, you know, have been very clear in their uh, dislike of those and the disruption that they cause. Um, I know that that might be an unpopular conversation to have um, overall, but I think a lot of these folks are coming from out of the county, Chief, like you said, because it is such a prime waterway to have that kind of uh, that kind of a boat and experience on. Um, you know, so I, I guess that was the point that I was trying to make. I like the idea of having a, a boating advisory committee but I don't think that changes, as Commissioner Netherland said, you know, I mean, we don't necessarily need another advisory committee to tell us what people have already been saying for quite a few boating seasons now. And we don't need a boating advisory committee to tell the sheriff's office that you need more resources or you need to enforce the ordinances that are on the books. You know, so I, I, I think we can have that. I think we can have that conversation and be just as effective as going through the process of starting up an advisory committee to tell us what we probably already know. 
And again, you know, just being straight up front on this, we've had discussions in the past, we've created even positions, but once we create that position, we don't have a say on that position being used the way we created it as a commission. We just don't, it, it, it is not under our purview. Uh, one of the things I personally would love to have a rule that says we can't have those type of boats on there. But the first thing that I think about immediately because of that though, is although most of these people, and I do believe it's most, do come from outside of the area, what are we telling the people that actually bought property there and live there and have their boat that does that same thing <laughs> that are actually residents there that all of a sudden their investment in their fund is just gone. Just keeping that in mind, but I got no problem with changing some of those rules because I don't know that they should be there anymore. Anyway, there's too many people. Uh, it's not that I'm against the boats. There's just too many people on that lake. Uh, in every fashion of boat, including those little floating uh, party barges that go, you know, five miles an hour with an electric motor on the back. They just can't keep up with something like that. But I think that's always the challenge of, you know, legislating is that you're, you know, that, that you know, unless it's something that's new and hasn't been proven at the market level yet, you know, a, a restriction is going to affect people um, who have already bought into something that, you know, but the other thing that kind of gives me a little bit of assurance there is that Chief Sperling said uh, Sergeant Severance had gone through and looked and, and you know, a lot of other places aren't um, restricting these. I'm sure there are other lakes that are less populated, um, you know, where they'd still be able to, to take advantage of, of the boat that they bought. So it's a, it, is a, it, is a tough, uh, it is a tough thing to weigh out though, Commissioner, I agree. And I, you guys all got the survey, correct? That Mason Lake did? Yes. I was actually surprised. There wasn't as many people against the over the transom boats as I thought there were. It's more of the squeaky wheels. Right, well, and you, you can't make everybody happy all the time. And, you know, I, we, well, we, we thought of other um, possible solutions too, is, is making it a, uh, a pay, pay to play, I guess, yes. on the boat ramp. But then that's, you know, then you have to have somebody going out and monitoring that as well. So that's, that's additional work for employees that we don't have. Or you could make it the honor system like the Port of Allen has and their, their little kiosk that they pay. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But I, is $7 going to, def, you know, de, make somebody decide not to go and play the, on the lake? No, but $7 by, uh, you know, by 10000 or however many we get, they go out there, uh, can go a long way for paying for some more extra help. But uh, with that being said, Chiefs, what you, you read the, the surveys. Are there any specific regulations that you just think need to be adopted and it's a no brainer? I'm not asking you to come up with that today, but perhaps you could bring that to us too, somewhere in between. And if it's a no brainer and it needs to be done, we probably just should do it. No boats at all. <laughs> um, I, obviously the sound ordinance, how we enforce the sound ordinance, it's, we really cannot enforce it the way it's written. Well, can you bring that to us in a simplified form so we can get behind that? Because that one there is has always been one of those uh, ones I've been questioned. Because, yes, granted, in the court of law, it may not stand, but 80% of them are going to follow that rule anyway. They'll pay the ticket or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to see us change it to where it is enforceable, though. We would have to obviously work with the courts and see what other counties and jurisdictions have done and had success or not had success. Thank you. It, it seems to me, it kind of reminds me, Chief, of the conversation that we had with um, Tim Whitehead uh, a couple of years ago regarding the, the dog um, complaints. You know, how we, we shifted around the, the, um, uh, the language in the ordinance to, I think it was that uh, it went from having to observe uh, the infraction to preponderance of evidence, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not recalling that particular one. It sounds familiar. I recall it. Yeah. I may not have been a part of that. Was I a part of that, Commissioner Shooting? I felt like you were. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe I'm just <laughs> not remembering. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I, I think he's right. I think it was, uh, uh, it was a, a, a deputy that brought that forward. 
Remember, he actually did the work on it and stuff. Um, was it Drogman? He did the boat. Oh, that, was, that was on the, uh, that the, was the boating. Yeah. Alarm systems. Alarm systems. Yeah. Oh, okay. So here's a question on the boating. Can you, as a commission, can you uh, mandate a fee for the that lake specific? A fee that would be say five hundred dollars a year. A big, a bigger chunk that everybody would have to pay. I wouldn't want to do that because the people of the county paid for that to charge them something like that to use it. So then, then you offer a discount for their their the fact that they paid a property tax. I have no problem if we can find a way to do it to where uh, those who pay <laughs> the, our county residents pay a lesser fee. I'm always okay with that. Okay. So I will have Sergeant Severance do some research and we'll try to come up with some new verbiage and uh, present it to you in some type of a briefing on the ordinance and the enforcement of it for sound. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Sorry, I was a bit distracted. I'll be sending the code to somebody. Goodbye. Thanks. Opie does aim. Can you? <laughs> I'm like jumps around and it's really hard to get. <laughs> we can still hear you, Cheryl. <laughs> All right. Let's. Oh, the Zoom room, we gotta love it. Let's move along and go to our public works uh, briefing. Morning, commissioners. Good morning. All right, well, real quickly, let's just go around the room and uh, state who is here, although you can see it on the screen, but there may be people hiding in the room. <laughs> commissioners first. Randy Neslin. Just looked around the room, it's just me, Kevin Shooter. <laughs> And Sharon Trask, I see, I still see people walking past your windows, kind of, yeah. kind, of, kind of odd. All right, who else do we have on here? Loretta Swanson. Dave Frank Smith. Pinter. Dave Jennifer Smith. Jennifer Byerly. Kelly Frazier. Hey, Dave Smith is on there. I keep hearing him. <laughs> Hi, that's me. <laughs> Richard Dickinson. Victor Rett. We don't have anybody else hiding. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nobody under the desk over there, Richard. Uh, that's full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh, awesome. All right, Loretta, take her away. All right, commissioners. We've got a, um, a few vacations that the hearings examiner has heard and made recommendations and Dave will go through those. We're asking to put those on the action agenda for approval to vacate. And Dave can give you some quick highlights on those. Okay, the first one is uh, vacation number 400. And that is uh, recommend the board consider the, the hearing examiner's recommendation for approval. And uh, did you want me to go through all, all of them here one at a time? Do you have a preference? I do not have a preference. I'm okay with putting them on the agenda. I'd probably be voting against them, but might as well just get them on there. That's, that's going to happen. Okay. And then vacation uh, 402 is uh, consider the hearing examiner's recommendation and uh, it'd be approved. And that's at East uh, Eleanor Peak Place. And the third one is vacation 403. That's vacating a portion of unused uh, East Mason Lake Drive West. Uh, so those are the, the three that we have. Was there any questions? No questions for me. No questions for me. Okay. Commissioner Netherland, are you good? Nope, no questions for me. All right. All right, thank you, commissioners. Um, next up, I think, since I just lost my agenda, <laughs> <laughs> my computer is not 
cooperating very well is a proposed agreement with Fire District 11. And what we have here, commissioners, we, we talked about or brought this forward, oh, I want to say a couple weeks or so ago, and followed up with some additional research. And what we're proposing now, I, it does say three years, but we're actually asking for a one-year contract so we can pay for services in 2020. I did speak with Chief Searles about this, and he is in agreement. And then we can come back and take a look at specific services in the future that may be needed for the public works facility. And those are primarily associated with um, the fact that the public works facility is a little bit different in that it is served by a reservoir and has a different fire suppression system that uh, other districts might not be, um, well, districts may not be accustomed to typically using city water service. So just a, a quick question. Um, I'm okay with the one year. However, my question is this, is, this had been in place since 2016, this contract. Was this not budgeted for 2020? I did not have a specific budget item for this in 2020. That's correct, Commissioner. So how, how had this been getting paid previously then? Under intergovernmental services, we do have a line item that would include that. So we do have a bars code item that we could pay for this service. And actually the first agreement was executed in 2009. It was, and Anticipated or um, as part of the, the new facility. So I guess my question is if the contract was in effect for this year, what why would we need to do anything right now on this and just come back with a so that they, they could they should in theory still be able to get paid for this year? It's 2021 that would be an issue, and it sounds like there's conversations ongoing about adding to it, I'm not sure that we need, why we would need to do anything other than pay them. Uh, we certainly could. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up the agreement, but I believe it expired. Um, While she's looking for that, uh, I'm glad to hear that it was before that because I was pretty sure that that was already in place well before I ever came here because I never remembered having a single discussion on uh, a new contract of that sorts, especially in 2015. But it's always possible, but I, I thought it was much older. And the only thing I can remember is uh, uh, something that carried forward, a, a reissuance of, a, of an agreement. Loretta, do you want to just take a, a look at it a little closer and then come back to our next brief, briefing with a... Sure. Oh, so the, the summary sheet says that it expired in 2019. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. It was in 2019 that it expired and they're asking for it for a three-year and now we're talking about doing a one-year. And coming yeah. back. I'm in favor of coming back with the one year to, to get it through this year since it is, I'm sure, in their budget. And uh, with COVID, I don't want to hurt any of them and have those discussions in our our uh, budget here, our budget meetings about whether to extend that. I'm good with that. Yeah, me too. All right. Thank you, commissioners.
right, we will bring that forward for um, one year so that we can pay for services in 2020. Great. Okay, um, Richard has an item to, um, well, an announcement of a promotion and then a request to fill a position. Richard? I kind of got, let's see, I, I think we're talking about the same person. Michelle Morris yes. has been promoted to, uh, she took Britta's Creed's old position as senior accounting tech. And now we have a, an open position. Michelle's old position is, a, it's, I believe, is a clerical? Uh, yes, it is. It's a clerical one position. Clerical one position. We'd like to re-advertise and hire. I'm in favor. Sounds good to me. Thank you, commissioners. I'd like to say that there's going to be some big shoes to fill there. Michelle um, meets daily with our utility customers and handles the billing, and she just does a, an, an outstanding job working with our, our various water and sewer utility customers, and she will be missed in that position. Now, wait a minute. Aren't you responsible for hiring her to the new position? So it's your fault. I know, right? <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> I'm sure she'll bring those great customer service skills to her new position as well. Well, it's always exciting to see somebody advance. Yes, most definitely. Okay, now I think that there's um, engineering. Oh, yes, we've also got a uh, request commissioners to um, advertise for our on-call services. And these are services that we typically put out every year or every other year. And these are for our geotechnical consultants, our hydraulic analysis, um, a variety of services that we may need on a short notice. Um, and that's why we go with our on-call service contracts. And we are requesting approval to do that again this year. Good with me. Yes. I'm good. Thank you, commissioners. Now there's also a, um, looks like a replace resolution 2020-62. Correct. That was for the vacation request. Is that right, Commissioner yes. Travis? Yes. So Phil, or excuse me, Dave, if you could speak to that. We had, we were forwarding a vacation request and the applicant modified it to include a portion of the alley to the north of the property as well. Yes. And, um, uh... We went out and looked at that at the uh, new request and uh, forwarded the uh, recommendation to the hearing examiner on that one. Sounds good to me. And commissioners, any other questions about that proposal? No, not for me. Yeah. Me neither. Okay. All right. We will forward that request to the hearings examiner as well then. He's busy. I know. The hearings oh. examiner is busy. It just seems like there's been quite a few requests lately. Yes. We're clearing them out. <laughs> and be good to wrap those up. Yes. Um, commissioners, I guess the other thing just to share with you as under a discussion item, I did speak with a property owner along Island Lake and a handful of residents there are looking to meet with representatives from Public Works to talk about speeds along Island Lake Drive. 
and we're um, waiting to hear when that date might be set and will be available to meet with the community. So I just wanted to advise you that that's moving along. And then, right. so, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna ask if you would just keep me in the loop on, on that, um, I'd like to participate. And also, um, do you have a sense for when we would be able to see the data the first round of data from the signs that we installed there? We should be able to download that in the next week or so, Commissioner. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You bet, thank you. And do you have somebody in the room that's new to Public Works? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to introduce our finance manager, Victor Rett. And very happy to have Victor on board. He's already been bringing a great, um, great attitude, excellent um, work ethic, and of course, great experience. And very, very pleased to have Victor on board. And I know our finance team is really excited to have him as well. <laughs> Thank and you, Loretta. getting yes. us all um, trained up here tomorrow and prepping for budget. So much, much thanks to Jennifer and Leo and their assistance. And of course, we're wrapping up our, our field audits. And yeah, Victor's hands are full with all kinds of good things. <laughs> well, thank you, Loretta. And uh, good morning, commissioners. It is a pleasure to join the staff of uh, Public Works and um, um, I look forward to serving the citizens and, and residents of uh, Mason County um, and uh, uh, bringing a additional um, uh, expertise uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, answer and respond to your questions. And um, um, I suppose that's it. <laughs> Welcome aboard, Victor. Welcome, we're happy to have you, Victor. Uh -huh. I look forward to, to meeting you in person one, one of these days, but welcome aboard. We have an amazing team. Thank you, I agree. I'm very happy to be a part of it. Well, we're happy you're here. Make sure you have anything for Loretta? Um, if I may, commissioners. Oh yeah, sorry. A quickie update also. I have had some conversations with Chief Wielander in preparation for um, winter in the Skokomish Valley. And I'm not sure if uh, Chief Wielander was able to join in on the Zoom meeting and Ross may or may not be here also, but uh, we definitely have our mindset towards what we can do to make life a little bit more comfortable or be prepared for our um, our road closures in the Skoke Valley this winter. Is, is Chief Wielander on the line by any chance? I or, do not see uh, him in the room. Okay. So what I, what I would ask Loretta, and if the yes. commission is okay with this, uh, is if on our next briefing day, we specifically have an invitation to both Chief Wielander and Ross to have a full conversation about what the Valley is going to look like what options are available to us for the um, fall and winter. Mm -hmm. I think it's just really critical that we all get together on this one and have um, number one, an idea of what we should expect and how we're gonna communicate that to the community as well. And I think um, Chief is a, is a good uh, conduit to the community out there. People, uh, people still like firefighters, I think. Um, so <laughs> I'm sure he'll be really helpful in that. But I, I think we absolutely need to have a formal invitation and briefing on the issue. Right. That's a great idea. So Frank, can we make sure that we have a an invitation go out to the chief? Absolutely. And Ross would be here, except he's out sick today. Okay. Um, the, un the unhealthy air got to him and his asthma, so, uh, but we will set one up for next week. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, commissioners. On a, a few other notes, uh, Loretta, can uh, 
you guys get me that update on the the breakdown of what's happening on the Effendall Pass, Belfort, to who you rode. They were going to look at some of the different options, put a timeline together and get that back to me so I can uh, put that out to the people there. I also was going to get a little bit more information from them on that culvert drainage pipe uh, timing and stuff so that I can let the people know that as well. And please, uh, an update on when that compression break signage will be occurring. Okay. Dave, are you still on and do you have anything at this time to add or will we follow up? Yeah, so, so um, commissioners, I uh, got with the engineering manager over at the PUD and they are well aware of uh, what we want to do there. And uh, Chris uh, told me that he would uh, find out whose cabinet it is. He believes it's uh, CenturyLink's cabinet and he's uh, going to find out who the contact person is. And he was actually going to contact me. I'm surprised I haven't heard from him yet, but I'm going to follow up on that today. But uh, we're going to we're going to get the cabinet moved. I, my understanding is it's going to be fairly easy to do that once we find out whose it is. So that makes so much more sense. CenturyLink's cabinet that now that would explain the one I found in Belfair because I've now seen another one. It's right in the middle of Belfair. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know how it ever got there, but there it is. So I will have, uh, I'll get you some information uh, this week, Randy, on that and commissioners and uh, give you an update, but I hope to have something very soon on that and get that thing out of there. Yeah, and the timeline on uh, on uh, moving that uh, stop bar and stop sign and whatever happened with uh, DNR when it comes to rerouting those uh, ATVs through the middle of that intersection. So the, the um stop bar what we were going to try to do is wait for the cabinet and figure out where they're going to move it to and then decide where the bar needs to go because it's sort of contingent on the the visibility there and so that's uh we're waiting for that information but we are uh you know we're prepared to move that to wherever it needs to be well if we wait until they get all that done it could be a long time uh, when we if we're gonna if we intend to move that stop bar anyway that that uh cabinet's going backwards it can't go forwards right <laughs> Yeah, I may get out of there altogether. My understanding is they may not even be using it, but um, we can uh, yeah, we can certainly uh, move the stop sign now and the uh, and the stop bar uh, uh, before we get the cabinet moved. I hope the cabinet gets once we realize whose it is. I, I hope that it will be taken out of there soon. But we can we can go ahead and move that stop bar now. And what about the DNR, uh, the access from those guys that are just shooting right across Kitty Corner on that intersection? So uh, we have a person on our tip cap that actually uh, works for DNR and it has some responsibility at that park. And uh, I'm going to reach out to him and uh, hopefully be able to meet with him out there or get the right contact person who would uh, be able to have a say in it and uh work with them on getting that thing but but as of right now i haven't reached out to dnr okay please keep me in the loop on that one because that's one of those two accidents is they come straight into that intersection we have to we have to change them to go into the road instead of the intersection okay i will keep you in the loop thank you thank you thank you dave All right, anything else, commissioners? I did have one thing. I, yes. I took the road trip with you and um, Mike, and it was it was very informational. It was, it was uh, I have to say it was a little fun. I enjoyed being out on the road, seeing our beautiful county again. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to do a little road trip, Commissioner. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're excited for um, the crews, as you know, doing chip seal and our pavement preservation right now. And we've been really pleased with the work that they've been performing. Um, Purdy Canyon was just completed and we we did running up trails road and very, very nice quality work the crew's done. So good job crew. Yeah, some of those roads are, are, are um, difficult. They are. Uh, a lot of them are, the shoreline roads are steep 
Often many are very narrow. Uh, we're working in people's backyards and the neighborhoods and it's um, that all of those things can be a little bit challenging and we appreciate our community's patience as we go through and, and do this necessary work. I'm always proud when we go from county to county and I take my, my trips with my kids or when we go to different places. We have it so well here in Mason County, even going from a local county to a local county into Kitsap and some of those back areas, you know when you're in Mason side, you know when you're on the Kitsap side. And uh, whenever you see some bad roads in the county, it's usually state highway and it's not ours. Just wanted to make that point for those that are out there listening. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right. When are we going to get? When are they going to change? Do the three hundred? That is a good question. I'm sorry, Commissioner. We were supposed to get a schedule back to you. We'll give our friends at DOT a ring. Thank you. All right. Do we have anything else? But yeah, I, I got one last thing just to get it off my mind and off my plate, hopefully. Um, I was asked to develop a recycling survey and I sent that out to commissioners. I got, Sharon, I got uh, your feedback back, but I just want to get touch base with the other two commissioners to find out if they're good with it or if there's any additions or subtractions or, or maybe it went to your spam and you haven't even seen it and would like to. Richard, I didn't have any um, any major issues with it. Uh, I thought it was pretty straightforward. I'll take another look today and confirm that I'm I'm still of that mindset. Okay. Same here. Okay. Appreciate it. What is your and I, just to be clear to for you know for the sake of this conversation, this is a survey to understand people's recycling practices better. This isn't a survey to eliminate recycling in our community. Uh, we want to be able to improve uh, access and service for customers, as well as understanding, um, you know, how we can better educate people to, to recycle effectively. I think people often forget um, recycling is, is third on the list of, of what you ought to be doing. So it's reduce, reuse, then recycle. And so recycling is often the last line of defense in, in helping on, on the environmental impact that way. But if you're not recycling properly, the odds are what you intend to recycle ends up in a landfill. And so we need to be mindful of that. We need to understand the practices that people are doing at the home, at the curbside. And this is, I, I really appreciate staff developing this, Richard. I appreciate you putting the effort into this to understand better um, you know, what we need to do to improve recycling in Mason County uh, and not eliminate it. I know that was uh, something that I had heard uh, from a couple of folks um, and just really simply not the case, just really a complete misrepresentation of the conversation that we had had um, for whatever reason. Um, but this is a good opportunity to learn more about where our community is on this important issue. Our overall goal for those that are listening out there and as you said, putting out something that's inaccurate, our overall goal, what we've been looking at is trying to find a way and whether it's more beneficial to internalize. It's amazing how it gets changed into so many different things out there. Yeah, precisely. Uh, and Kevin, you nailed our, our intent is uh, find out what, what people are doing, if they're doing it correctly or not correctly, what, what uh, educational opportunities we may be able to focus in on to help people out. And, and you're right, Randy, we're trying to find out what, what is the best way for us to do that, uh, be most cost effective and accomplish the goal. I guess this is a good, uh, a good maybe uh, opportunity to update the commission um, and staff as well on conversations that we first started back earlier in the summer with um, SC Johnson Company, um, wanting to look for an opportunity to do a pilot project on recycling plastic film. So your plastic grocery bags that uh, that have become even more popular here during the pandemic. Um, Zach and, and Richard had been a part of those early conversations. Zach continues to um, work both with SC Johnson and uh, Waste Connections at, at Mason County Garbage. Um, and they're narrowing down on a partnership uh, proposal that would help, that would, um, that would allow us to work closer with 
both Waste Connections and the city of Shelton on, on this uh, potential pilot project. And so it's exciting. Um, and it just, I think it, again, reinforces uh, our commitment to, um, you know, reducing waste in the community and, and bringing together a public-private partnership to do that, I think, is is uh, really a great opportunity for Mason County. So uh, I think reports of uh, recycling's death in Mason County have been grossly exaggerated. I think there's a lot more positive on the horizon, and I'm excited about it. No, I agree. I think the survey is, um, is put together well. Um, I appreciated you asking for our feedback. Um, I think we, we went through it and it looks pretty good. Um, as far as uh, my comments and stuff and re removing some of the things that made it long that people might decide not to, to uh, participate because of the length. But I think recycling is definitely not going away in Mason County. And so let's make sure that people understand that. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. And thank you, Richard, for jumping right on the, the survey work. Most appreciated. Yes, well done. All right, do we have anything else, Loretta? I think that is it for now. Okay. All right. Well, thank your team out there. They're amazing. Thank you. We will. All right. Commissioners, we have on here a, a, a break. Would you like to take a break or do we want to continue on? A couple of minutes, please. All right. We'll be back at, it is now 1024. So let's be back by 1030. Thank you. Uh, and good morning. Uh, we've got a couple of items that we wanted to talk about. The first one is the CDBG COVID-19 emergency grant funding. Um, if you remember back in April, the Department of Commerce extended a grant for $126,878 to Mason County to add on to the CDBG public service microenterprise grants that we have uh, we received annually for a couple of years. The county decided to split that um, 50,000 to microenterprise and the balance of it to Community Action Council. Um, microenterprise was successful in distributing 20,000 of that 50,000. They have $30,000 left um, and they don't foresee being able to distribute that. So they're asking the commission if it would be okay to take those um, unspent dollars and transfer them into the public services grant and allow Community Action Council to distribute that 30,000 to households rather than micro enterprises for additional COVID relief. Honestly, I would rather because that money was, we wanted it to go towards businesses. I would prefer that it would go to the EDC so that, because I do know that they do have some businesses that are still in need. One of the problems that we have with how this thing was set up was how small of a business they actually have to be. The requirements were not realistic at all. You, know, well, you almost have to be a business that, do, that doesn't have a business. You have to be a failing business to qualify to mean where you were failing from the beginning if you consider the amount of money. So it was designated as part of their micro enterprise grant program, which required you to be um, in lower um, income category as a business. And so it does limit the amount of businesses that it can service. Um, so it can't be used in the same way that, for instance, we gave the uh, EDC 300000 to to assist businesses for um, COVID-related expenses. These dollars need to go to low and um, below certain threshold um, 
recipients. I can't remember exactly what it was. And the saddest part was it was for the whole business could only make so much. Correct. Or have so much. Not that the individual, the individual was still made nothing and couldn't qualify. It had to be um, under a certain number of uh, employees with a certain number of um, dollar revenues. So it's difficult to get that type of business in Mason County. Um, and so the EDC would then also contribute in the distribution of those dollars, um, but it could be transferred to the Community Action Council for citizens. Or we could just leave it and see if the microenterprise group can continue to distribute it to relevant businesses. So Frank, just a quick question here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it looks like in the briefing summary that six businesses had declined to take the, the funding uh, that was offered to them. Do we know why that is? Is that- um, I don't know. Okay. And I, I'm just curious if it was because there's, because of the requirements of the program or because their business was no longer, you know, quote unquote, in need. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. The other, the other question I would have, I mean, I'm obviously, I think, you know, I, I think it was intended for businesses. And so I, I like that aspect of keeping it with the EDC. Have you had conversations with them uh, regarding how they would, you know, mitigate some of the challenges that they've had in getting this money out? What are, what is their thought process on, you know, finding ways to get this distributed? Otherwise, the Community Action Council, I mean, this, what would this go for there? I mean, you said individuals, but is it for utility well, assistance? Is it for what, I mean, that kind of thing? I mean, rent, is, utility assistance, um, delinquencies. Uh, things of that nature for citizens. You know, because I think, you know, the, the question becomes, you know, if we're having people decline the money through the EDC or we're not clear on how the EDC is going to be able to distribute the remaining dollars, you know, is there a different parameter that the that the Community Action Council uses that would make this, put get this money, you know, liquid into people's accounts quicker or more effectively? And I, I think that's, you know, that's an important question to, to kind of parse. I can determine, have those conversations and look back as to why the six um, businesses turned it down and then bring this uh, back to the board at our next briefing. One of the big things that, you know, is their ability to even put together the documentation when you're that small of a business that is required to meet these expectations. We're not, we're not realistic on how these things are put. I shouldn't say us. The program's not realistic on how it's put together and what's expected of them. One other thing, if we're going to do something like that to consider is some of our local stuff, um, you know, like North Mason Resources is constantly working with people that are trying to be able to cover their, their bills, cover their, their electricity, cover their, their rent, cover. It'd be a lot better if we could keep it directly local with some of those entities uh, more than shipping it off. Unfortunately, however, this package grant was packaged under the CDBG program and its umbrella, which has its own restrictions and limitations. So um, what we can do is go back to the EDC and the Community Action Council and see how we can better package this as a business-oriented program um, and then come back to the board. I'd prefer to see it go, go to our businesses. They're struggling as it is. And so if we can help them out, I would, I would like to do that. Great. We'll do that. The next item is the CARES Act funding update. Um, obviously, um, there's a number of changes to this document. Um, it's somewhat of a live document, and I'd like um, you know, the commission's input on how to uh, modify it if necessary to better um, assist the board in understanding uh, what are the options and what are the um, what are the details of the items that are listed there? 
The first major thing is, is Mason County received an additional million, roughly million three hundred and ninety thousand dollars of funding and an extension to utilize these funds from October 31st to November 31st. So there's more money to put towards some of the programs that the board would like to use for assistance. Um, what we have, what I put highlighted or brought forward, excuse me, were the PUD request, PUD3. Um, they had brought forward a request previously for various options, one of which was for delinquency, delinquent accounts. Um, there's a number of utilities that have put forward requests for delinquent accounts. The PUD1 has also requested $50,000 for assistance in covering their PUD. Uh, Hood Canal Communications has put forward um, a request for $105,000 for delinquent accounts on their um, services. And the Port of Allen has requested um, additional dollars for lost revenue, $18,000. I know previously we talked about whether or not lost revenue can be identified as an item or recovery. Um, a county can't use those dollars for lost revenue, but I'm not sure if a business who has lost revenue should not be availed of the opportunity to use CARES Act monies. Uh, we donated $300,000 to the EDC. I was going to say a business is without a doubt. That's the that's the that's what they have to show. That's where some of the problem comes in. They have to show their loss. So we are doing it for business, but government entities, though, still, I'm curious about. Yeah, and that that's that's the issue there. Port of Allen is a government entity, and do they fall under the same umbrella as the county, in that we can't assist them with quote lost revenues, um, revenues lost to COVID related. Uh, issues. So we're, I'm doing some research and we'll uh, talk with WASAC this afternoon about okay, whether or not they're, they are or are not eligible. Okay. Can uh, you send a message? Because I think Tony will be on, Tony Hansen with the, with Commerce, he'll, he'll be on the call at noon. So okay. let's, let's see if we can either send him an, an email or, or uh, ask that question while we're on that, that call. Correct. I will. Um, the other one was a letter from the state suggesting that the counties look at nonprofits and what we can do with the funds that we have to assist with nonprofits. I have not had any indication from any of the local nonprofits about what they may or may not need as assistance, uh, but I'm just highlighting that as an open item without any dollars attached to it to keep that on our list so that we may um, either act upon the request from a nonprofit that comes to the county or be proactive in looking for who might need some assistance. Uh, one of the other items that has come forward is um, the request by the courts, and this isn't on our list at all because this came out last, uh, the end of last week. The courts would like to change the, or continue updating the the um, air conditioning, heating, and ventilation system in the existing courthouse, most specifically the superior courtroom. Currently, there's a antiquated system there that is um, not working properly and is excessively noisy, such in such that the court cannot hold court while the system is operating. So there is a $105,000 ask that the court is putting to the, um, the administrator of courts for additional CARES Act funding from them to cover the upgrade of that unit. Actually, it's a couple of units. Uh, the county has started doing the upgrades. I, I see Kelly's on. Um, Kelly, do you want to speak to that point for just a moment? Um, sure. Uh, so it's a, 
upgrade to the whole second floor of the courthouse. Um, our system is uh, built and we put a tower on the roof to cool the whole courthouse off. And uh, we have only have a few units that is hooked up to that. Um, so this would hook up to what is there. Well, we was going to be phase three to the courthouse um, you know, five, six years ago when we did the upgrades that we have just never got to or whatever. So this would uh, put new system in the, both courtrooms upstairs and in the administration office, <clears throat> which would take the new filter system, which would uh, filter out 99.9% uh, .9 of whatever it filters out. And uh, we would put a new blower system on it so it would blow throughout the court room without the noise that it's making now so they can conduct their court and, and jury trials. The problem is that they've spread out so far that the, they're talking all the way across the room and with that going, they're not able to hear. So with that said, just, just um, this is not coming out of CARES Act money, at least the county's money. It's coming out of the AOC's funding through to the courtroom. So they have put in an application for funding for the 105,000. What the county will need to authorize is a, a sole source approval. As, as Kelly mentioned, this is the third phase of a project that we've been working on. And Frank, I have actually went out and got uh, three bids for this and the 105 would be the cheapest bid through uh, Bradley Air. Okay. So, um, and that we would, uh, it would require an authority to use a sole source uh, process in purchasing the, um, the unit. So the, the courts will be bringing forward for next Tuesday authority to go ahead with the purchase of this based on the authority from the AOC as a sole source purchase. So for Frank, our so we've already started this process, right? Are, are they pretty sure that they're gonna get the funding from AOC? Yeah, I'm fairly sure, yes. I have not, we have not started on it except look into it and bid it what it would take. Um, I am looking for the thumbs up as soon as we can, of course, because it takes a while to get the equipment here and get it going. Uh, we're going to have to do some core drilling all the way to the roof of the courthouse uh, to bring in uh, fresh air and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. And Kelly, by doing this this process, is that going to open up more space in the courthouse? Or are we using, still having to use the, because I know up, upstairs in the main courtroom right behind it is the big unit. Yeah, it will, uh, it will open up a little bit more space maybe in the jury rooms um, because we'll be eliminating that unit that's in there and moving it so it's not making a noise against that one wall. Uh, but as far as space for the courts, no. Same, same, same space. Same space, better units, upgraded units, upgraded filtration, and quieter units. What it does allow it them to do is to utilize all of the space that they have. Correct. Right when they're spread uh, social distancing, they can't hear from one end of the courtroom to the other because of the noise of the unit and the lack of the filtration. Are they using microphones? Uh, they are using microphones in their recording, but on the recording side is where the hum of the... Uh, the hum of the noise is coming in from the air moving. That wasn't supposed to be snarky, but. Oh, <laughs> I think I'm going to ask that question too. <laughs> so that's just, this is just a heads up to the board. Uh, the, the courts are waiting for approval from AOC. And once they get that approval, we'd like to move and jump on it very quickly to get the uh, system ordered and to get it installed as quickly as possible. When do they anticipate hearing? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think the last one they heard within two weeks. 
Yeah, I think Judge Goodell uh, was thinking that they would uh, would be hopefully uh, by the end of this week or at least early next week, I think is his thinking. They did submit it already, so hopefully that gets through really fast. Okay. okay. So um, one of the things that we're going to come forward next Tuesday is for authority to transfer to the EDC the funding for the um, local media, as well as funding for the Community Lifeline program. Um, do we want to add funding for utilities for past due delinquent accounts? and funding to PD, PUD3 for hotspots. I'm sure, may I? On that, I would hope that, uh, you know, I'm, I know that uh, the rest of us are, are on board with giving money to the PUDs in a sense, uh, even through the EDCs when it comes to uh, taking care of some of these clients. I have no problem with that. We can show that they was actually due to COVID uh, you know, just giving people that didn't want to pay their bills money uh, that were delinquent. I'd like to have some type of mechanism to show that it was delinquent because of, for example, you lose your job and you got an extra six hundred dollars uh, from unemployment. You and you decided not to pay. That was your choice. You're actually doing better than you were before. Many of our our neighbors were, but uh, if those that lost their job and then weren't able to get unemployment, that's a serious uh, connection for COVID related not paying the, of that bill. I'd also like us to consider if we don't, if we can, the PUD for the hotspots, they're working hard on getting the, the funding for the hotspots in different areas and they've not been successful. But and w- without a doubt, I think those hotspots are definitely a direct COVID related expense. I'd love to see us consider doing 50% now and 50% in November if they're not able to find other financing because they are still looking and, and not everything is is uh, expired. They haven't gone through everything yet. Because if it can come from somewhere else that we can't touch, it would make more sense to get some of that funding from that. Mm-hmm. So I guess my my ask of you is to consider 50% now, 50% November, if they cannot find uh, funding elsewhere. And uh, before we start throwing money out there that we find a way to show that it was COVID related for paying for these uh, delinquent accounts. I'll just jump in real quick um, on that. I, I think uh, I'm comfortable with the 50% for the Wi-Fi. I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a critical need. Part of it, um, and I had a conversation last week with uh, Annette and uh, Creekbaum and, and Lynn Eaton from PUD3. Um, part of it is the reason I asked Dan Tudeberg this morning to send over some information on other funding sources. I, I'm, I'm interested in sending that over to the PUD to see if they've reached out to those entities to have, um, you know, to have that conversation as well. Um, and I think this helps kind of, uh, you know, support that program as they investigate what other opportunities are out there. I think it's really critical in particular in our rural parts of the community that there's access, um, you know, to internet, especially with kids, you know, doing the remote learning and, and people still uh, potentially working from home. Um, I am supportive of, and I think we should move forward with the um, assistance to the utilities for delinquent accounts. Um, I'll use PUD1 as an example. They have narrowed their request window, um, you know, specifically to target um, potential COVID related uh, uh, accounts. And I trust their judgment on that, Um, you know, and so I think we have, we have the ability and the opportunity to move forward with um, providing that kind of a relief uh, to utility, not just the utilities, but to their ratepayers as well. Um, but I also would be interested in a couple of other things for the commission to consider. One, and this is this is directed at, at Frank and staff, is getting a reconciliation of the of the spreadsheet of what we've committed to and what we've dispersed already, and just kind of clarifying that so that we know kind of where we stand, even with the additional um, money that was um, recommitted to the county. But I also think having a conversation with the commission about um, the nonprofits in our community, we know that there's a need, even though that that, I mean, Commissioner Netherland mentioned North Mason Resources. Um, you know, a lot of these nonprofits have, uh, you know, have been scraping by in good times um, in order to serve their their clients. 
Um, so I, I would imagine in, in the economy that we're in that they're probably struggling to get their regular donors to participate who you know, may have to shore up their own finances. So I think we should do a broad ask to nonprofits in the county, um, you know, develop a, develop a system where we can determine need, but just blanket the county nonprofits and, and ask them to, um, you know, to do a, a submission that way. Um, the other thing we'd be interested in talking about is what resources our schools might need um, in the interim too. I know that their CARES Act uh, contributions um, in many cases have been run through and just trying to determine what needs they might have through the fall um, and then potentially looking at a second round of business support. Um, Commissioner Trask had mentioned um, that the EDC still has a number of businesses that are uh, looking for support, I'd be interested in having a. Um, I'd be interested in having the EDC come back to us potentially with a request uh, for a second round of business support in the fall. Yep, I would like that as well. I I I think that um, I spoke with the the PUD three also with Lynn, and I trust them to to know who needs it. I mean, they had, they went out for the they have the 30, 30 60, 90. So people that are doing are on the 90 day list. Um, I trust that, that they know that they're, they truly need that money and to pay for those bills. We don't want those, want them to be cut, um, <laughs> not have their electricity or, or their power. Um, but, and, and also for the hotspots, um, I, I would agree to pay half now but I have a feeling that we'll be putting the other half out there as well. Um, the, I'm fortunate to be on the, the public works board and we talk about broadband frequently. There's not a lot of funding sources out there anymore um, to reimburse or to help get that money out there, not even from the federal government. And so, um, and there's not, there's no grants available now through public works as well. So I think that eventually we'll be paying that that half. Um, but I would I would be willing to wait until November, just make sure that we, we get that out there before the end of November. Okay. <clears throat> you're muted. Ready. So again, I'm supportive of the second round without a doubt. I'd like for us to do that, but I'd like for us to, to have the EDC come in and look at different parameters. The parameters that we've set has, has hindered some of the, the businesses that need it the most, uh, their ability to get it, because we used somebody else's parameters from before uh, when we did this last uh, um, putting out uh, of funds. So perhaps they can bring us an ability to, to widen that net so we can help more businesses that may be in, in trouble right now. Um, I, I met with one down here. They're talking about that's been open for a year, things like that. You have a, a, a store right here in Shelton that this last weekend we were talking to them and they literally, uh, they didn't qualify because they just bought the business. Even though the business has been in business for years, they had just bought it. So they didn't qualify. And then boom, they bought it in January. Mm -hmm. So being able to have access to help them would be wonderful. Uh, the media uh, monies, again, I'm hoping that we put that on the agenda immediately. I love the idea of the nonprofits. I'd like for us to think about actually keeping a cap number that spreads out amongst them. Uh, so, you know, it helps, but it doesn't, it isn't giving them everything. The uh, monies for the PUD, I want to go back to that one again. I'm still there for the 50%. I like that. On the ones that are um, for paying their past bills, I want to make absolutely positive that we are all, all right with being allowed to give them that money without having some mechanism to show that it was COVID related. It just seems very dangerous to me. Maybe I'm overdoing it, but it seems really dangerous just to give somebody money that because they're 90 days behind that has nothing to do maybe with COVID at all and no mechanism to show when they come back to us to, to ask for our, our proofing of why it was given nothing to show that it had anything to do with COVID. So if we could please just get something from them to help to help show that a little bit more. And then I'd also like you to consider, I'm asking you to think about uh, the EDC again. We keep asking them to do more and more and more and more. Uh, 
they weren't designed for this. You guys know that, but they sure stepped up and have been able to do it. I've never been one that is that has been for giving them a bunch of money each year, but this year they their services rendered uh, far exceeds anything that we're giving them. I'd like for us to consider giving them a little bit more uh, this year and to consider, believe it or not, uh, a small increase of maybe 20 for the uh, increase of 20 for the, the budget for the next year, realizing how important that they are and this is gonna continue. Um, just a, a question on the EDC, I guess. Um, no, no particular heartburn about entertaining that commissioner. Have they utilized the uh, additional money we have already put forward to them? Did they bring on extra staff, or what? Do as your as our representative on their board, have you have you heard of any operational changes that they're making to accommodate? I have not broke that down, but I do know, I would expect that uh, there is there is something to do with overtime for these folks, because I got to tell you, I've got Karn and them actually out walking the streets of the, the community. There's no way that we're paying them to do that type of stuff, but that's where they're at now. And we're talking a lot of extra hours, but we should, you're right, we should ask, uh, you know, what extra duties, what extra things that they picked up in order to show they've expended that money. But again, you know, that's not part of their purview, what we're asking them to do. Even if we're looking at another round, we're gonna ask them to do all that all over again. That's a lot of a lot of time, so. And I would, and then I'm back on the, the um, PUD assistance for their utility customers. You know, I view that very similarly to, um, you know, how we treated the EDC. We block granted the money to them, um, you know, to do assistance. Uh, the EDC, I think, did a good job vetting their applicants. They yeah. knew, you know, they knew how to address the need. Same kind of concept, I think, with the PUDs is, you know, I trust them to vet these accounts and understand their customers and their needs, um, you know, to fulfill it uh, appropriately. And I think as a sub, sub recipient, you know, the burden is is going to be on them, um, you know, in, in those cases. And, and I do trust their judgment. Well, the one thing I, I agree with that, and I can I can go with that. Uh, the one thing I got to say though is the EDC had a structure that they're still before they're giving them money, they're making them show all these different things uh, to show that that they qualify for it. If we have something like that set up for these people that are receiving those funds, I don't mind it at all. Matter of fact, I highly support it. If we can find a way, and there's some mechanism or some documentation that they have to show to show that this is COVID related, it doesn't bother me even in the slightest. I believe PUD1 discussed that in their request letter. And in my conversation with uh, PUD3 last week, I asked for them to take another look at the, uh, look at the spreadsheet here. And I think they had um, uh, 300 or so thousand dollars for uh, residential customer support, um, asking them to go back and take a look at that number to refine it. Um, you know, a little bit and see, you know, if that is the true need or, if, you know, if that's um, mm -hmm. retrospective or prospective or, or whatever, so that we have a, a more accurate number. But um, until I hear from them, I think, you know, that shouldn't preclude us from moving forward on some of these others, um, you know, who have already vetted their, their accounts like PUD1. All right. And Frank, I just sent you an email that I received from, from Lynn, um, from PUD3. And, um, they they go into detail, so they they've already looked at at the at the reasons why people may um, may not have paid their bills. So take a look at that. Um, I also okay. sent it to Jennifer. Yep, I will. Um, so is it a go to add additional funding to EDC for staffing? I think here and Kevin will wait until we're going to ask them to show what they did with the other 21st and then we'll have that conversation again. Okay. Well, I mean, is that what you said, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and I don't mean that to, to micromanage them in any way. Um, you know, my, my approach would be, it might be, might be more beneficial for Jennifer and Karen if, if, you know, we were, you know, funding some extra help versus paying overtime. That's a decision they have to ultimately make internally, but, I'd like to know if they did, if they were able to utilize the initial additional administrative fee that we we sent their way, and then what what a maybe a what would nest what would be necessary or helpful for a second round, um, you know, for them to administer that. So I would I would actually just kind of be looking for them to to make an ask. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. And I'll agree with that. I, they didn't ask me. I just knew that, that they'd been putting in all this time. So it'd be wiser to do what you're asking anyway. Let's do it structured. Let's see what they're at and then make some decisions. Because I, I mean, I totally, I mean, I think, you know, there is, there is a cost to them administering these funds on their side, just, you know, as there is on, on everybody's side, um, you know, and it's sort of outside of the scope of, of our current agreement with them. So I'm totally good with that, but I would like them to design what works best for them and then make that ask to us. Okay. And uh, the utilities that would include Hood Canal, correct? Correct. So, so oh, I, you know, I the, the I'm not sure I'm there yet. Yeah, I, my, my <laughs> I think my thing with, with Hood Canal is I, I would encourage them to go through the EDC process for business relief since they're, I mean, you know, I think the initial, at least my initial understanding of the utilities was looking at public utilities. So our sewer and water utilities, PUD1, PUD3, Belfair Water, um, and so on and so forth. I think, I think it gets a little murkier when we go into the, into a direct contribution outside of a business grant to a private entity i think there's a there's maybe a more appropriate channel for them to to go through to get relief i agree with that i thought I that they were part of the media group well that that was the ten thousand as the uh, for uh i fiber and for um journal. Uh, journal. yeah those are media i don't know that hood canal communications is actually considered media even though they have a channel three so to speak I'm not sure they're considered media. We have a contract with an individual that utilizes them as a media outlet, so to speak, and that person works for them on media, but I don't know that's one of the same. And their ask is 105,000 for delinquent accounts. Yeah, would we do that with any business that we, if they have delinquent accounts, we just cover them. Yeah, we would, what we've done in the past is sent them to the EDC go through their economic assistance request process. And then that's been limited to $10,000. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I think, you know, it, at least as the, as the world sits today, you know, trying to parse utilities, you know, I certainly look at, at water and electric as a more essential utility service than necessarily what Hood Canal provides, um, but I do think they have an opportunity to work with the EDC to potentially, uh, you know, look at, at some of the potential new funding that we're going to open up for business. Okay. And if we were going to do it for Hood Canal, would we also be doing the same for Wave and for Comcast? Yep. And, and where it gets well, as a utility is internet a utility of some sort. Yeah. Um, but all three of those have larger footprints. Wave and Comcast both have larger footprints on Hood Canal. Well, there's a lot of people, though, a lot of students that are using that service, and a lot of people that are working from home. So I want to, I want to keep an open mind when, when it comes to that as well. Okay. So we'll bring some of the items uh, back the next time. We'll have for Tuesday um uh, a contract that's going to push some of the funding back to the edc um and um we'll put that on the action agenda for next tuesday well uh so far the only thing i know for sure is the 50 percent for the uh pud the the 20 grand 10 10 to the media and uh the 10 grand for the showers uh what other ones did we agree to expend for next week yeah it was just the Community Lifeline, the media, um, the 50% for the hotspots, um, and the delinquent accounts for PUD3 and PUD1. Okay, are, are we for sure moving forward with those guys, the, the PUD accounts, without having anything yet uh, for structure? Or? I, I would I would rather, I would feel more comfortable just giving a, a an amount not the full amount, but find out how many are delinquent on the 90 days. Can we discuss with this one a little bit further? I'll bring those, I'll bring those two items back uh, at our next briefing. Okay. With a, which, with a much more tighter scope. Okay. Next item 
is we have an offer on two parcels, 2169 and 2179, Lake Boulevard in the amount of $50,000. Um, the two market values for those are just south of a hundred thousand. Um, the county's um, assessment on those are um, somewhere around five thousand one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Huh? Right. I think you got it backwards there. No, uh, Frank. What it is is it's got an assessed market value or whatever of ninety-eight thousand. Their current offer is fifty thousand. We've currently had both parcels on the market for almost a hundred days at thirty-five thousand per. The the actual amount that we would have uh, the treasurer recommend as a minimum when they did their auction was five thousand plus one hundred twenty-five thousand. Yeah, that's. I thought that's what I said. <laughs> With that, uh, after reading them, I I got a question for the commissioners on this one. There's a possibility there is still meat on the bone. The question is, do you want to do it? Uh, uh, it was on the market for almost 100 days without a price reduction. So this is the, a realistic value at 35000 each, or it's not higher than that, I would say. Uh, they're coming in at 25000 each is what they're, what they're saying for them. Do we want to do a counter with a little bit back, uh, or are we good after being on the market for 100 days? Uh, to sell it for that much less. Again, each parcel was on the market $35,000, so that would be $70,000 combined. They're making an offer for $50,000 combined. Would you, I mean, what would you think about a counter at 30 each? That works for me. Is that, is that I mean, is that out of the... I mean, no, I, I, I think, I think right now the property values are all going up, so I, I don't think that that's, that's a bad move because even if we sit on this, if, if they say no, they'll either counter back, but if they say no uh, and we're holding on to this one, that isn't a bad thing looking at the location. I think it, we're going to get it eventually. Okay. Good. So 60 combined. I will do a counter uh, 60, 30 each um, with uh, the broker. Okay, next item is the discussion regarding reopening of building one downstairs. And um, I guess the recommendation, my recommendation would be that not hearing of any complaints from citizens about accessibility to the commission or to staff, um, that we keep the appointment process uh, until the governor's emergency declaration expires. Right. And can you give us an update as to how uh, uh, the second floor, let everyone know how that's going? Um, I can't specifically, except to say that they are still working through some issues, both um, logistically as well as software, hardware. Frank, could, commissioners, could we uh, think about this just for a second longer on... I appreciate your recommendation, Frank, for keeping it at uh, appointment. I'd like to see us move closer to normal, but I, I get that, especially with some of the things we have going on in the office. But I'm watching these people amass in that hallway, and that's not good for our constituent either, not having an ability to spread them out a little bit. Can Is there a possibility of a hybrid where, where it's still appointment past the lobby, but in that lobby could maybe be used for these people that are massing in that hallway? Well, you're, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. You can finish up. Sorry. Well, you know, being that it's an enclosed area, granted, people should not be st standing so close together, but because it's enclosed, you end up trying to get in the elevator, basically. And that room isn't much bigger than two elevators. I think, you know, I, I get what you're saying. I think one of my concerns was that, you know, in a similarly situated lobby upstairs, the offices didn't want people congregating up there. And I just I don't I'm I'm still not convinced that if it's if it's not good upstairs then why would it be good downstairs? And you know, it, it, I think you know there's there are places to stand outside that are covered, um, you know, in in the interim. Um, but I just I'm concerned about overgathering in our lobby to avoid overgathering upstairs. 
Well, and I believe that, oh, I'm sorry. No. I believe the system is um, they make their appointment and then they can sit in their vehicles or or wherever or come back when their appointment is, is scheduled. So I think um, I'm here every day and so I see it a little differently probably, but it's not, they do socially distance, they do wear their masks. And so I don't see us opening our doors as helpful to any of it. I think too, part of it comes back to, you know, we're changing, um, we're changing habits with this new system, the kiosk from upstairs. And I think that just takes time. I mean, people are getting used to the software and the, the process. And um, you know, I, I think my, my key, my key metric is going to be seeing people, you know, use that system effectively um, so that they, you know, that they're checking in the right way. They're going back to their vehicle or, you know, or whatever um, without having it, you know, log off or having upstairs staff have to come down and attend to it, you know, frequently. So I think that's a big indicator for me is, is just trying to smooth out some of the bumpiness of implementing a new system too. Right. Right. And I do, I do believe that, that appointments, um, I myself, I've not had too many requests for an appointment. And so I, I think we're meeting the needs of the public at this point in time. I don't see us having to or needing to open up yet. Again, my only concern is is literally uh, what I can see with my eyes is that we're bunching them up in, into a corridor. Granted, they should be outside. Granted, they should, just like our roads, we go by the 80 to 85th percentile on how it's actually used, not according to what we want it to be done. No matter what, we could bring four different corners in that lobby and take away a lot of the, the chances of them spreading the COVID in that in that tight quarters. I'm, you know, I'm not going to press the, press it further than that. I'm just telling you, it's not about even us and everything. If they still have to have permission to get anywhere else past that lobby, but that tiny room that they're all meeting in is pretty tiny, and we can make a difference there. So that was why I brought that up. I appreciate that. I prefer staying status quo until until. They, we make sure that their their soft opening is is a hard opening. Okay. Can we have uh, can we have them come back and brief us on the twenty eighth? Absolutely. And update us on where everything is, and then maybe we can reevaluate then. Yep. Um, next item is the pandemic exposure control mitigation. Um, last briefing, the board had asked that I prepare a shorter version of the policy. Um, I have um, prepared one previously, and I've also now modified it and reduced it and um, even further and made it a set of guidelines with some links in the document to CDC, DOH, LNI, and other uh, government agencies to um, assist in researching and um, um, present what the guidelines are that these government agencies are requiring us to perform. So I brought it back to the board for your review and comments, and then we can pass it to the other electeds and department heads for further comment and um, an ultimately consideration of the board to put forward. Frank, have you shared this with um, Dave Windham and Dr. Stein yet? Yes. Did you get feedback from them? Not yet. I shared it at the end of last week. Okay. So I would be I would be comfortable once you have their feedback, then sharing it around more broadly. We'll do. They're going to kind of be in my mind. You know, Dr. Stein is going to be a big part of. The approval on this so certainly interested in what he has to say absolutely next item is housing authority update um so i met with um well had conversations with tim whitehead regarding the housing authority and the 
proposed offers on two of the parcels or two of the apartment complexes, as well as the request by the housing authority to um, dissolve. So the issues around the housing authority, one is only the county board can create a housing authority, which the county did back in 79, I believe it was. In order to do that, there are three criteria that the county board looks at. Um, one is um, that there is in um, un, insanitary or unsafe inhabited dwelling accommodations for citizens. Two, that there's a shortage of safe and sanitary dwelling accommodations for low-income residents and that there are, is also a shortage of safe and sanitary rentals and other living accommodations for senior citizens. So those three basic um, requirements were reviewed in 79 in order to set up the housing authority. In order to dissolve a housing authority, only the board of county commissioners have that authority. The Housing Authority Board itself does not have the authority to dissolve itself. And part of the reasons that must be considered as part of dissolving a housing authority are the same criteria, which is to say that the, um, the reasons that you develop the housing authority in the first place have been corrected and the problem has been resolved, which in our case, I don't think we can state, which is predominantly why any housing authority that has ever been created has never been disbanded. So only the board county commissioners can dissolve the housing authority. It needs to consider those three items in dissolving the housing authority suggesting that the problems have gone away. Um, and if the housing authority is dissolved, all of the property, the assets, and all of the liabilities come back to the county to manage, as well as the need to staff the management of those properties going forward. So the issue here is the current housing authority board is having difficulty getting together to meet, to make decisions, to act as a board. There's a chairperson that is predominantly managing the entire process that is becoming overwhelmed and is has the board itself has become ineffective. The recommendation of both myself and Tim is for the, rather than dissolve the board and take, have the county absorb the functions of the housing authority, that the housing authority board members be reviewed for um, participation and or additional or new members be solicited to help with the housing authority board or or and or to put and have the housing authority board put out an RFP for management assistance, utilizing a nonprofit organization to assist them with the management of their um, responsibilities. Well, I, I like the idea of soliciting a partnership to assist them. I I I think we will continue to struggle to attract. Um, board members to it. I mean, nobody wants to come in to a situation that's, you know, as um, challenging as this one in a, you know, in a volunteer capacity. I mean, it would take a, you know, I mean, Mother Teresa has been unavailable for a little while. And I, I think it would take that type of a person to come in and, and want to take this, this on. Um, and I just think the current board is, you know, they've been, they've been working on it for the past few years. And it's, you know, it's, it's a frustrating, it's a frustrating situation and, and they're probably burned out. Um, you know, that being said, I, I, I like, we, we had been, I think, heading in the direction of um, you know, potentially divesting some of the properties they had been 
Um, and I think they were very interested in finding a partner who could come in and handle the everyday um, intricacies of, of, the, of a housing authority. So I would be interested in exploring that a little bit more. Um, I agree, we can't dissolve it. I don't think we meet that criteria. Um, you know, and I, I, I think the other, you know, so we, I, I think we need to see what opportunities are available for a partnership out there. Um, you know, and I, I would probably imagine that comes with a price tag. So we need to be mindful of that too. And if you remember um, last April, I believe the state authorized for a, the um, House Bill 1406 to tax or, or to allocate a certain portion of property taxes for housing assistance. So there are some funds that are available um, through that um, act. Yeah, that, that is, um, that's a, it, it's a, it's a portion of the state sales tax that I'm the sorry. counties and cities are able to opt into um, reserving in the county for, for, the, for those needs. The commission had um, dedicated some of that funding to the Kyoto Villages project, uh, the Tiny Homes for Veterans project. Um, and I believe we did put some of that money also toward roofing um, and decking uh, at one of the uh, housing authority properties. So um, Todd Parker would probably know exactly this, the status of, of that funding, um, but you're right, that is an option, um, you know, as well as, as potentially 2163 um, recording as well. So I will, I'll work with, I have talked to Todd, I spoke to him this morning in anticipation of this briefing, and I will circle back with him um, and we'll put together an RFP for assistance for the housing authority. Um, do we want to recommend to the housing authority that they go forth with a, a yellow book appraisal on those two parcels to at least determine what the value of those parcels might be? Who will pay for it? Maybe. You know, that's, it, it, that's what I'm saying, because it's not like uh, they have the money in there. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the whole situation, if you don't mind. You know, I've okay. been I've been thinking about this one, and, and, you know, from the very beginning when I first got elected, I went and sat with them. And one of the problems is, is, is this commission, we may end up with the properties and stuff, just like any nonprofit when it goes out, it has a designated group that gets the properties and, and, and the like. Uh, it was clear to me from the very beginning, they're trying everything they can to save something uh, and keep the price as low as they possibly can to the detriment of the organization and to the detriment of the buildings. The buildings keep getting less and less and less uh, well taken care of. And you know they're just trying their best to save these people. But in this county, we have a huge uh, housing issue. We have people that are not just at the very lowest that can't find housing here. We have them above that and above that. There's several different layers that can't get housing here in Mason County. My first uh, belief back then was they needed to look at divesting themselves from these projects that they can no longer afford because they've held on to them so long and, and to, to, their, to where their value has gone down and they can't operate in the plus because they can't charge enough. They need to divest themselves of those properties, but not by somebody giving an offer. You need to put it out on the market. Yes, you need to have that appraisal, but then you put it out on the market and you let people uh, bid on it and try to, to buy it at, for its highest and best. Then with those monies, your housing authority turns around and builds a brand new house. So now you have new housing it, it is the absolute goal to continue to have new housing for those low income people. There are restrictions on some of the funding, but a lot of that restrictions could be paid off with the proceeds of the, uh, of the sale of the properties. Can, one of the questions I have is can the commission, if we're gonna do this anyway in a roundabout way, can they take this under their wing, so to speak? Can a commissioner serve uh, on that board? You know, or, or can the commission have a say in how those actions are created? This can be saved and it can be saved in a way to where it's beneficial to the community with brand new low income housing and these ones here would get upgraded by whoever buys them and brings them up to a newer lev level of, of rent. I understand that. But at the same time, it'll keep it from going defunct and that's what's gonna happen anyway. Somebody else is gonna have to buy it, manage it, replace it, 
It's just that the difference is, is you actually get money for it and you start building for the next phase if we were to continue forward uh, with us taking some control there. Not control, bad work, it's not our, it's not our, our, our thing. With us taking some leadership <laughs> there. But although with that leadership, uh, I understand there's also liability. And we'd have to think about that. But I, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, you know, I, I really like, well, I don't like it, but I, I, I agree with the idea of finding a way for a commissioner or the commissioner to serve in some capacity that's more clear on the housing authority board, because I think that's a, I mean, we're, if we're potentially going to be, you know, inheriting the properties and, and the, the issues that come along with them, it might be nice to get involved, you know, or have a more formal role on there prior to us getting to that point so that we could provide a little bit of direction um, or some alternatives. So I, I like, I like where Commissioner Nevelin is, is thinking on that. I feel like we should have been involved a lot sooner. Yeah. Or, or, and on the board a lot sooner. Yeah, but we couldn't. So far, we're not even sure we can do it now. But, you know, here's the, the bad end of it. The bad end of it is we end up with it anyway. We end up uh, selling the properties because we're not in property management and we don't want to be in property. We couldn't afford the liabilities. And everything goes with that. So like every other county that's ever gotten into this situation, they get rid of the properties and they're in the same position they're in now. If we do it this other way to where we're, we're in it or we help to direct it or move it and keep this organization together, they could sell those properties, take that money and use it again to build new properties and actually have some relief for our community. Where I don't see us doing that, if we end up getting the properties and we sell it, are we gonna go out and build properties? I don't think that's gonna fall on our plate properly uh, within our purview. So what I will do is I will work with Tim um, to see whether or not we can have a commissioner represented on the board. It may take a modification or a change of the bylaws uh, or the charter of the housing authority, but um, I'll come back to the commission then next time with some um, detailed recommendations around how we can do that. Also ask please, what are the liabilities for doing that? Although I, I love that I wanna do this. I think it's great for us. I think it's the only option for us I'm saying that without knowing what the actual legal liabilities are. I'd like to know what those are before we commit. Of course. And um, so I'll have Tim with us the next time. Okay, so next item, uh, Diane, is a schedule of the Wasac Courthouse briefing meeting. Diane, are you on? <clears throat> so commissioners, we received the request from Wasac to schedule an annual briefing. And I wanted to know if you wanted me to go forward with that. Yep. Yep, I don't see why not. Okay. And then I submitted in there a fourth quarter meeting schedule for briefings and commission meetings. And I made sure like in November, the end of the month, we need to make sure we have a hearing to adopt the levies. And then I noted that first Monday of December is your 2021 budget hearing but does the schedule look good as it's submitted for now? I'm comfortable with the caveat that it can be changed just like you've always done if, uh, if the clerk of the board just decides that it uh, means necessary. Yeah. My only, my only um, comment on here is when will we anticipate filling in budget here or budget workshops and the like? Yes, that's why I have been the next topic. We needed to know some direction on how you want to handle the budget workshops. Um, did you want to go into that then? Uh, are you good with the schedule that Diane's presented? Yeah, I'm fine with the schedule. I, I just would, you know, move into the budget workshop, I guess. Okay, so yeah, I just want to know, um, first of all, um, how you want to proceed. I mean, there are quite a few departments that have PLR requests. Um, so um, I'm thinking that they're going to be faster than last year, most likely. But um, I would I would think scheduling um, some time in October would be would be good with, um, you know, the first budget um, briefing maybe being the week of the fifth. 
And did, did you want to do that um, on the same day as briefings? We could do it in the, in the afternoon or right after um, the briefings. I'm good, I'm good with that. We're here. So. Okay. Doing it right after the briefings. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and that can be well, our. Um, no, two o'clock has to be after two o'clock. I do chemo, remember? Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do uh, two o'clock, and the the first one then on the fifth will just be um, to go over the budget as a whole, where we're at. Um, you know, revenues, less expenditures, and um, and then did you want to schedule then the following week, maybe the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, somewhere in there, um, budget briefings with departments? Unlike that, I think, you know, I, I think, you know, there may be, you know, as is, has been the case historically, some offices don't, you know, request them, but I, I would maybe offer up blocks of time for offices that do want to have a conversation, um, you know, to sign up for those times, I, you know, we're all available or could block out our, our calendars to be available at that, you know, at those times to do it. But I think one of the other things to add to our initial briefing is, you know, I, I you said budget as a whole, but to be clear, I, I'd also like to see what a status, you know, like a status quo budget as being our budget presentation, um, you know, that day and, and just really define the box. I think that we're going to work in going forward. Which okay, not a problem. May, um, you know, determine what offices want to ask for briefings or, or don't, but I think we should be open to hearing from all of them if if they so choose. Okay. I, I would I would agree with that. And I like the idea of keeping that simple box. If we're all agreeing that it's a status quo plus uh, the increases, that needs to be the box. And, and if they feel that they have an argument for anything above that in specific, that that maybe could be their, their briefing with us uh, on the budget to, to make their case for it, but that it's not necessary. If they can move forward with that, knowing that that's where we intend to go, it should make things a lot easier. We can do it sooner rather than later. Okay, great. So we'll schedule that on the 5th at two o'clock, um, the initial budget meeting to go over um, the maintenance budget versus the prelim, um, look at the differences, the PLRs and see where we're at. Um, then on the 12th through the 14th, we will uh, leave blocks of time open for departments. Did you want to also maybe um, schedule some time the following week in case we need to follow up with some departments on certain things? I think that's a good idea. Sure. Okay. And uh, then we can um, look at final finalizing the budgets. Uh, we could leave blocks of time open the week of the 26th, maybe uh, of, of October, and then the week of the 2nd through the week of the 9th um in case you know there's a few things we need to finalize that sounds good to me sounds good to me okay perfect then um we're almost done <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, anything else on on that before we move on i'm good with it i'm good good I'm gonna make most of those after or two o'clock and beyond. <laughs> Do most of them two o'clock and beyond? Well, the Monday ones. For the Mondays, yeah. Unless, Mondays, yeah. Okay. Unless the uh, the twelfth commissioner, would you be available in the morning, pre chemo? On the twelfth, I'm I'm. That's the day I'm flying in of twelfth of October. Yeah. So yeah, let's, let's not I'd rather not if we can't. <laughs> yeah. Let's. So maybe not do the 12th, but maybe do the 13th, 14th, and then one the following week then, would that be better? Yeah, good. Okay, so the 13th, 14th, and it, any, time of, any time of day on those two days? Yeah. Preferably mornings, I would think. Yeah. Okay, and then the 19th after two o'clock. And again, I'm hoping that it's only if absolutely necessary, because if they know that we're pretty, pretty, strict on sticking to uh, uh, you know, maintenance or not even maintenance, uh, status quo plus uh, increases on staff, you know, they should only want to impress us hard if uh, they really think it's absolutely necessary this year. Because again, for myself this year, 
it isn't where we're at financially as much as where we can be if things change uh, in the legislative year. I hope it doesn't. I don't think it, it even will. But if it does, we would not be prepared if we started spending that money now. No. Okay. We just count on them handing us more mandates. Yep. <laughs> I don't want to bet with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So um, moving on to the financials. So on page two for August of 2020 financials, we have um, the revenue for current expense. So far uh, through August, we've received $24,261,487. And uh, at this time last year, we were um, at 24,477,523. So just a couple hundred thousand under where we were last year, but um, the total is at 63% of our budget um, compared to last year, we were at 68%. And um, I did check with uh, the clerk's office and the reason their revenue is down so much is, is due to um, mostly COVID with their doors being closed. Um, they are not processing passports. Um, their filings are down garnishments. Um, they no longer receive interest on legal financial obligations. And so the, that was the reasoning for their um, lower revenue amount. So any questions on, on this before we move on to the treasurer's revenue detail? Mm -hmm. okay. So moving on to page three and four, the treasurer's department revenue, we've got um, 16,637,454. And this time last year, we were at 17,232,509. We're at 63% of our total budget. And this time last year, we were at 70%. And um, the main reasons for that are, again, the, um, the DNR Timber Trust, um, the interest, interest is down. Um, property taxes are actually pretty flat with uh, where they were last year. We're just slightly over. Um, the forest excise tax is um, is down. Um, city county assistance is down, and um, payment in lieu of city of Tacoma is is down about a hundred thousand. Um, so, any questions on this before we move on? On the expenditures for current expense, we are at 23,575,638 through August. At this time last year, we were at 21,919,481. And we are at 61% of our total budget, which is exactly where we were last year at this time. Um, any questions on this? On the six year uh, specific revenue streams comparison, um, the Department of Community Development revenue continues to, um, to climb, which is great. Um, the, again, the property taxes are pretty flat with last year, just slightly above um, the... Um, well, what, what did we have for an increase uh, that we put in the budget? For the property tax, we we did a one percent last year. That's all. Yeah, but it doesn't work out to be exactly one percent. It's actually a little bit less um, because of the way the um, formula is calculated. Um, so it's you know a rather complicated formula. Um, so anyway, our our property taxes are down a little bit if you look at you know the one percent if you're um, including that in, in the calculation, um, the collections are down compared to where they ought to be, I would think at this, you know, comparing last year and this year, but not too much. On um, the sales tax, uh, we collected what I think is a record for um, Mason County, um, 700,000 uh, for August. Um, I did check with the, um, Department of Revenue on the reasoning or if they could tell me any information on how much of that was um, 
was back taxes, people paying um, currently, and and they couldn't. They they said you just have to kind of guess. That's <laughs> basically what they said. They said um, there's not a way to show exactly how much is due to sales tax reporting extensions. Um, so. Anyway, um, moving on to rural sales and use tax fund. Um, we're up to 547,000. The homeless, homelessness prevention filings are up to 531,000. Uh, lodging tax is still down um, 235,000, but it's not horrible. Uh, the REIT is up at 972,000, so that's great. Any questions or comments on any of this? No. Uh, what a, do we have a number of what we have uh, actually on hand? On uh, can you get us a number of what we have already promised out for the REIT and for the rural sales and use tax? You can just send it to me by email later. Okay. I'd be interested in that, in that number too. Okay, I'll send it to all three of you individually. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to page seven, the property tax, I'm sorry, the sales tax detail. Um, so we have uh, 702,000 collected for August. Um, at this time last year, we were at 614,000 or 615,000 roughly. So, um, Quite, quite a, a difference. Our, our total collection, again, is 4.2 million compared to last year at this time, we were at um, 3.874 million. So, um, so we're doing great on, on sales tax. That's a silver lining. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so moving on to page eight, the six year financial recap. Uh, our cash balance is good right now. We're at 12.961 million. Um, again, we we are at 63% of our budgeted revenue and then 61% of our budget budgeted expenditures. So um, so nice to have a, a healthy cash balance at this time to lead us into next year's budget, especially. Uh, questions on that before we move on to the um, special and other funds cash balances. No. Looking at the screen, uh, Frank is in is frozen in the in a perpetual state of uh, questioning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, moving on to the um, the special funds cash balances on page nine. We are, um, you know, up on their cash balances too. Almost every fund has, um, or most funds have a higher cash balance than they did in 2019 at this time. At, we're at 32 million, 169, 113, which is about 2.6 million over, um, over last year's cash balances. So, um, so current expense is not the only fund that is um, sitting pretty well cash wise at this time, which is great for August since usually that's, um, you know, a pretty, a fairly low cash month, cash flow month. In the past, I'm looking at, uh, oh, never mind. I found it on my own, Never mind. So any, any other questions on that or uh, questions before we move on to the motor pool? Jennifer, quick question regarding the public health fund. Okay. Up significantly uh, <clears throat> over the past couple of years. Is that due to receiving state COVID money or? I believe so, but I'll check on that. I'll check with Casey and um, do you want that in an email also? Yeah, that would be great, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so moving on to the motor pool, um, we have 658,000 and that's on page 10. Uh, Six hundred and fifty-eight thousand three dollars budgeted, and so far this year we've spent two hundred and ten thousand four hundred and forty-seven on motor pool um, expenditures for current expense and health, and that is uh, thirty percent of our total budget. Um, 
down below we have the breakdown of you know what types of expenditures that 210,000 covered and then um, below that is the uh, capital and capital upfit amounts that um, are not currently budgeted that uh, we'll be adding to um, to our our next budget um, request and um, I also wanted to uh, end this with, um, we're going to need to extend the that third quarter budget amendment um, one more time <laughs> to um, November 17th at the soonest. Um, it could possibly be delayed until December 8th. So just wanted to give you a heads up on, on that. But, um, are all the other, are the entities okay though? I'm okay with it. It doesn't matter to me if we don't have to have it. But I just worry because we had a meeting with uh, the sheriff's department earlier today, and they are starting to worry about some of those, uh, some of that dollar amount. Well, uh, as long as we have something in the works, um, we're not going to get, you know, an audit finding on that. As long as um, as we're okay by year end, uh, we should be just just fine as long as it's taken care of. And I'd rather. Um, you know, take the time to do it right, then um, slam something together. Jennifer, what does that mean for uh, a potential fourth quarter? Well, I'm hoping we can just put them both together and and just do one. Um, so we'll have, you know, three this year instead of four. Well, that's a nice, that's a nice change in that regard. I think so too. I I, I'm so thinking maybe, okay. <laughs> maybe we should continue to that to next year and maybe just do, you know, two to three instead of our, you know, one a quarter. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kids App, what do they? They open theirs twice a year, right? I believe Thurston does as well. So maybe we want to look at doing that next year. Just do it, look at uh, two times and then, you know, a third one if we. Absolutely have to. Yeah, you know, I think I think that's worthwhile considering just, I mean, I, again, it would change, it'd be a bit of a culture shock, I think probably for some offices, but um, I think the ability to have offices kind of anticipate and plan a little bit more around that would, would benefit the county overall. And probably, probably, you know, you in particular, Jennifer, with having to prepare those amendments and in the hearings and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, um it's pretty time consuming, especially doing uh, the next year's budget as well. So yes, I would really appreciate that. <laughs> so, okay, that was all that I had. In case Thanks. I haven't said it lately, Jennifer, I sure appreciate you being in this county. Thank you. I like yeah. it. You're valuable. You're very valuable. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Well, Frank's not here anymore. So no, no I think that He's, yeah, uh, I think he froze. He's in space. He said that uh oh wait, there he is. Frank. I did text him and tell him that uh, oh here, here he comes back. <laughs> he I made it. <laughs> Two Franks. Two Frank. <laughs> look at look at you stuck in a perpetual question, Frank. <laughs> a Randy between two Franks. How about that? <laughs> That's true. That's an interesting. Huh. The the dark one is the one where I'm frozen. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that Frank's gone. That's no, just you. Just one. Frank. Okay. Uh, so, do we want to move on to the closed session? We covered mine already, so I, I'm I think I'm good. Yep, let's just move on. I'm good. So you want to adjourn this one and we can stay on this one if we we can ask everybody else to leave. Yeah, except for you.